It is Wednesday night in East Lansing, Michigan. My name is Jim Comperoni. Keep Austin weird. That's for old Tuck if he's on time. Come on in, gather around, gather around. It's a short week. Coming off the Labor Day weekend, Michigan State 38-21 victorious over the Northwestern Wildcats. At Ryan Field in Evanston, Illinois, a few days back, a few nights back. A short week, but I know you guys had a great weekend because of that Michigan State game. My name is Michigan State. My name is Jim Comperoni, publisher, SpartanMag.com. SpartanMag.com is the source for Michigan State sports, part of the Rivals.com network. The way this works is Michigan State fans have posted questions over at the Underground Bunker message board. Underground Bunker message board is part of the premium site, SpartanMag.com. Underground Bunker message board is the church of what's happening now with Michigan State sports. They posted questions over there. We've got about 15 of them. Couldn't get to all of them. We're already into Wednesday. Uh, couldn't get to all of them, but uh, we'll be tackling those questions. We'll be fielding some questions over here in the chat area. I don't think we'll open up the phone lines tonight because we've got a lot of material to cover. Short week. I keep saying we want to do this three times a week, but, you know, Monday was a, was a holiday. Whatever leftover beverages you might have from Monday, go ahead and pour yourself some refreshments. I don't care if you have to work tomorrow. You can call in late tomorrow and tell them it's my fault. You know what I'm saying? If not, that's fine, but we're going to go right to it. we got some questions. We're going to get to those things. Michigan State, 38-21 over Northwestern. Got Youngstown State coming into Spartan Stadium this weekend on Saturday. Over at the football building today, we had questions, had some interview opportunities with Chris Kapilovic, Michigan State's offensive line coach and run game coordinator. We will have video of Kapilovic later over at SpartanMag.com tonight after I finish with this. Paul Konerdijk with a story already tonight uh, with some feedback from Peyton Thorne and what he thought about his performance. He spoke after practice today also. Also, Luke Campbell out there speaking. Very interesting story there. Did not play last year. Has not played since the Michigan game in 2019. 2019, he considered a comeback year because he was not happy with how he played in 2018. He thought he was complacent. Luke Campbell, offensive lineman, was honorable mention as a freshman back in maybe 17. Thought he was complacent in 18. Considered stepping away from the sport. Decided to come back in 2019. Didn't finish the season. Missed all of 2020. Stuck with the program. They stuck with him, which was a big deal because Michigan State when Mel Tucker was making his decisions on who was going to stay and which, you know, where he was going to look in terms of the transfer portal, they kept Luke Campbell based on his 2017-2018 film. Interesting they stuck with him. and They like him as a leader. He's one of these leaders that does not speak a lot, but when he does speak, he carries a presence. I heard today from Connor Hayward that uh, something was going a little bit awry with special teams in practice today, and Luke Campbell stood up and shut it down and, and got him going again. So he's with him. You know, he's second string offensive tackle, played both offensive tackle, right tackle and left tackle. I was surprised to see him. That's one of those things Michigan State does not hand out a depth chart. If they had released a depth chart, we would have seen Luke Campbell on there. If they were honest with it, we would have seen Luke Campbell's name as a second string offensive tackle. We would have asked about that midway through camp or last week prior to the game, but Michigan State keeps it quiet for reasons like that. So when Luke Campbell tried it out, out onto the field, that was kind of a big deal. Felt good for him. He's an honest guy. He's a, he's a very serious guy. And it was uh, interesting to get a chance to talk with him today. Anyway, uh, question number one from the mailbag comes from Griff from Hill Valley. He doesn't say where Hill Valley is. I don't know where Hill Valley is. But anyway, go ahead and, and, and throw in some more questions over there in the comment section. We will get to those. And we look, we look forward to having a lot of Michigan State fans tuning in tonight to talk Michigan State football. Your Michigan State Spartans are 1-0. and oh, Looked outstanding in a lot of ways against Northwestern. Mel Tucker, the press conference this week, says uh, he's hoping for a lot of improvement between week one and week two. Was not happy with every angle of the team, nor should he be, nor should a coach say he's satisfied after one win. We will talk about some things that Michigan State needs to improve uh, heading into the remainder of the season. Youngstown State might not put up a lot of resistance. We'll talk a little bit about that a little bit later, but let's get out of the first question. Griff from Hill Valley, he says, Coach Tuck said, okay, this, uh, this feeds right into what I was just saying a moment ago. He says, Coach Tucker said a team's biggest improvement comes between week one and week two. What's the number one area where you would like to see improvement this Saturday against Youngstown State? Remember to give us a thumbs up, subscribe to the channel, 
Go over to SpartanMag.com, become a SpartanMag.com subscriber. Try it for free for a month. We'll have some deals coming up, I think, pretty soon. Some, uh, actually, I don't know if, we, if we'll get that straightened out or not. So do it for a month for free if you're not already a subscriber. So what areas would I like to see more improvement? Uh, more improvement in the pass rush. You had a sack from Quiveras Crouch on a blitz. I can't remember the other ones. Michigan State was able to get some pressure when they blitzed, but did not get much pressure from their standard down four. Their front four linemen need to see more pressure from Drew Beasley. Jacob Panashuk is a guy that had success as a pass rusher earlier in his career, not so much last year, partly because of COVID. Expected a little bit more out of him in the first game. It just seems like when offensive linemen are able to get a hand on him, it just stops him for some reason. He's unable to disengage and get off. So I uh, need more from Panashuk. The first passing situation of the game, they put Drew Jordan in. Drew Jordan, I don't think, had any productivity as a pass rusher, but I thought he looked pretty good. I thought his takeoff was okay. I thought his hands were okay. Um, showed a little bit of body lean. I think there's some potential there. I was surprised Michael Fletcher didn't play more, a guy that had three sacks last year. A guy I've been saying since high school is not a natural turn-the-corner pass rush type of guy, but pretty good uh, pursuit speed, straight line speed. Sometimes you can chase down a sack from behind. Sometimes you can chase a sack into him. He's a pretty good play finisher, but did not play a lot uh, in this game against Northwestern, which surprised me a little bit. So the pass rush has to get better. Have to, oh, the other, the, the other sack was Xavier Henderson, which was a key sack to end Northwestern's first drive of the second half. Third and goal from the 12-yard line. Michigan State showed two linebackers over the A-gaps. So your defensive tackles are basically... Three, both of them are three techniques, a little bit wider, or five, or four eyes. Two linebackers threatening to rush. They showed that in passing situations most of the night, but they didn't always blitz those linebackers. Sometimes they showed it and dropped back. Sometimes they blitz. They blitzed. On this occasion, they showed it, and not only did the linebackers blitz, blitz, but the safety came also. Xavier Henderson, Michigan State, with a zero coverage. I think that's the only time the whole night that Michigan State went with a zero. I means zero safeties. It's man to man on the perimeter against four receivers, and uh, the deal is. Try to get to the quarterback before he can find somebody open in man-to-man. And they did have someone open, and Hunter Johnson was just a little bit late with the ball. A better quarterback might have been able to find that guy. I think it was number five, uh, Robinson. Was that his name? The guy that transferred from Kansas from Kansas was open on a crossing route. Got some separation there, but it did not have time to find him because Xavier Henderson was in him. So Michigan State does not obviously want to have to resort to blitzing all the time in order to get any pressure on the quarterback. Need to get it with a down four. You know, Beasley's going to get some sacks here and there. I would think Penishuk's going to be able to do it too. I think Jordan, if he continues to play like that, he'll get a couple. But I'm not sure that they've got, um, you, you know, it's like I said today in the V-cast over there at the Perlis Plaza. It's not like Shalit Calhoun's walking through that door. So they're going to do with what they have. That is uh, not necessarily a weakness, but it's not a strength in terms of uh, – this team trying to chase down uh, some bigger goals as they go. I know it's only 1-0, and but trying to chase down some bigger goals. All right, one area, He says, what's the one area you would like to see improvement in on this Saturday? I would say two. I'm going to say pass rush, and on defense, Ronald Williams, the corner transfer from Alabama, uh, would like to see him be a little, little sharper. Um, was not as fluid as I expected. And there's a reason you're not going to see a lot of six foot two corners because guys that are that big, they have trouble getting their feet wrapped around the hip turn. And he was, uh, the, the, you, you'd just like to see him be more fluid. He was beaten once uh, deep by the, the Robinson kid, the transfer from Kansas. And that guy with a release move and his burst was good. I think at Kansas, he averaged like 17 or 18 yards per reception. His teammates referred to him as a technician in terms of pass routes, and you saw him, saw that when he was, was trying some intermediate routes. I thought Northwestern could have and should have gone to him more often. They could have forced that matchup with uh, against Williams and gotten some more out of it. But on that one, it was press, and it looked to me like, and I don't think I've got video of that one, but it, look, it looked to me like uh, Williams went for an offhand jam, kind of missed him, and then when he hip-turned and ran, um, he might have been surprised by the speed of this guy, and he shouldn't be surprised. I mean, that guy... Williams played against Alabama talent all last year, but the receiver took off. Williams tried to take off, looked like Williams stumbled, got deep on him, caught it, safety helped over the top with the tackle. But there were other times against intermediate routes where I thought Williams just seemed a little awkward, and that, that surprised me 
a little bit. So you'd like to see Michigan State improve there. Question number two from Jacqueline JB, or I'm sorry, Macklin JB from Rochester, Michigan. He says, outside of running backs, which unit were you most impressed with, offense or defense, on Friday? Which unit were you most impressed with? Um, in terms of a player, I would say Cal Halliday. That's not an entire unit. We got a super chat from Matthew. Was that Matthew Johnson? Is that who that was? I'll have to look to see if I missed some others. Ty Garland in the house. He's an he's an, an official, actual Spartan dog. Matthew owes comp at ten dollars. Yep. <laughs> oh, that was Matthew. I get it because he had ten dollars that the microphone was going to fail. Well, it could fail at some point during the the broadcast. Has not failed yet. But Matthew Johnson, we certainly uh, appreciate your personal sponsorship to SpartanMag.com here. Thank you, Matthew Johnson. Matthew Johnson says, are you surprised that so many players rotated in on defense who stood out that was not expected to get on the field? And the way I finally did this correctly, we get a sponsorship from one of the maggers out there. Their question immediately goes to the top. I finally caught it, got it in time, got the question up in time. So we'll go back to that that question when I was talking the point I was making about Halliday in a minute. Don straight, Don straight. <laughs> Appreciate to get that from Don straight. Thank, thanks a lot, guys. And Don, if you got a question, we'll get right to it. I've got a question from Don, actually, uh, in the mailbag here. Um, sorry about those Panthers, Don. Big one this weekend, DeWitt against East Lansing High School. Anyway, uh, Matthew Johnson asked earlier, uh, are you surprised that so many players rotated in on defense? Yes, I was surprised. And they were in there early and often. Um, and I think, you know... I'm thinking part of the reason for that. Now, it's interesting they they, re, they rotated so much in the front six. Front seven, if you include the nickel, because they, they did have Darius Snow in there for Michael Dowell, including on one of the touchdown drives. Um, and Snow did okay. He's, he's, he's going to be solid. Uh, but they did not replace the corners and did not replace the safety. So they, those defensive backs stayed in, down in, and down out, which was interesting. I'm wondering if some of this, you know, Conan Dyke and I talked about this a little bit. If you've got not a lot of drop off from first string to second string at the defensive line, which I think is the case in some instances, then you go ahead and play more players because, you know, a, a Jacob Slade who's playing 25 snaps a game is going to be better than a Jacob Slade playing 70 snaps because he can go all out 25 snaps and, uh, not have to worry about pacing himself. Interesting in the defensive backfield that they didn't rotate those guys. I suspect you'll see that against Youngstown. They'll be rotating more guys in there. And, you know, first of all, there's not as much of a drop-off. Secondly, they like to play more players because it's good for team morale and all that stuff. But if there's a big drop-off, you're not going to play more players. Here's the deal, though. I think they're they're playing more players on defense than they did last year. I think they wanted to see who could... Who could get it done? It's a tight game against Northwestern. Even though the score got it was uh, you know a two touchdown game almost immediately, but still conference game to start the season. You're not going to do a lot of experimenting unless you think those guys can play. All right, that's one thing. So why are they doing it that way? I'm wondering if some of it is also to get the team ready for the Heat in Miami, down in Florida in two weeks. You're it's going to be a necessity to play more players, especially on defense and the offensive line for that matter. They played nine, I think, on the offensive line. They've got nine guys on the offensive line who have started in the past. But in the secondary, they're going to need, need more players also against Miami the way that you know they've got some speed. I know Miami was hammered by Alabama. Welcome to the club. So they need to be able to rotate more defensive backs in there. Kalen Gervin played a pretty good game, um, beaten over the top on that one play, but... Uh, it wasn't his fault. He was not beaten on that one. That was, and we, we've talked about that over at the Underground Bunker message board. I think I've got video of that right here. All right, so you've got uh, Gervin. Let's, let's rewind that a little bit. All right, this video uh, joins in a little bit late. You have 18. That's Kalen Gervin down at the bottom of the screen along the numbers. Just before, pr earlier in pre-snap, he was up on that receiver, uh, number 17. Tr Tritz or Trites, whatever his name was, good little receiver. At pre-snap, Gervin was up playing press coverage. And I didn't when I was talking about it after the game and when I wrote about it immediately after the game, I surveyed the defensive backs. I saw him in press 
and took my eye off him. Didn't realize that he had gotten back here to four yards and was bailing into cover three. I didn't realize that it was cover three by the time the, the snap came. And I, I tell you what, I was kind of in, I was not in midseason form either. So I, sh- I should have picked up on this. All right, you got two safeties deep. The camera doesn't have both safeties, but right there, that yellow line, you've got Angelo Gross on the far hash, and Xavier Henderson is not, that's Xavier Henderson coming in the screen right there with his helmet. So Henderson is coming down to make it, uh, coming down. Then you have, you have the, the two linebackers. This is I was talking about a passing situation, the two linebackers and the A-gaps, threatening blitz all day. Uh, and then at the snap, Halliday and Crouch go drop back into zone coverage. All right, so up at the, the far hash, that's Gross, uh, Angelo Gross. He's going to get to the middle of the field for cover three. So the cover three, it's three deep. Gross is one of them. Number 18, Kalen Gervin is the other. And Williams, the other corner, has already dropped into a three deep. So those three have, see how Williams is backpedaling and getting deep. So it's three deep. They've got each have a third of the field. So Kalen Gervin was not beaten in press man-to-man by this guy. See, Gervin is in cover three, opens up with outside technique to allow an inside release because he knows or thinks that he has safety help in the middle. So that's that's the technique. That's the assignment. So Gervin has him throwing deep, but he's expecting the safety. Now you see where Gross is. Gross is just crossing the 40-yard line right there. See, the corner Gervin is with him, but he's expecting safety help. That's why he allowed the inside release. All that Gross did, and this this replay does not have the end zone replay. If you watch the game and go back and watch the game again, they did show an, a, a, an end zone replay. Gross up there in the far hash, going to the middle right now. When I watched him, I initially thought that he might have been influenced by that cross or that over route. You see the the... The receiver running that in route behind Halliday there at the 40-yard line. He's running behind Halliday. It's a digger and over. I thought that he might have been influenced by that and come up and bit on it, but he didn't. When I watched it from the sideline, he did not bit, bite on that. He was not influenced by that crosser. Gross is supposed to get as deep as the deepest. They've got this receiver running a deep route. He didn't get deep enough. Gross did not hesitate. He was not influenced by a shorter receiver. He just had a difficult task of going all the way from that far hash to the middle, and it's a deep route right now away from him. So he needs to bust tail and get over there, which is difficult. But he got to the middle. He didn't lose a stride. The problem with Gross is that he simply undercut it. He arrives at the ball at the 42-yard line when he needed to arrive at the 32-yard line. He just undercut it. That's an experience thing. Some of you guys are golfers. Sometimes you use the wrong club. Gross just used the wrong club. This is an experience thing. His eye, he, he did not get caught looking at the wrong thing. He was not influenced up. He just undercut it. Now he's trying to make up for it. It's too late. It's not on Gervin. It's just one of those experienced things. Kaylin and uh, um, Angelo Gross is new at the safety position, and he needs to improve upon that, and I think he will in time. So that's what happened with that one. So, uh, you know, more safeties are going need to need to play, I would think. Um. But corners like Chester Kimbrough played a little bit at the end. That's a Florida guy. Should be able to adapt to the heat okay or better than most. You know, Williams coming up from Alabama, even though he's been here all summer, you know, playing in the heat, should, should he should be able to adapt a little bit better than, than maybe Gervin or some of these other guys. And you've got Charles Brantley, true freshman from Florida. Uh, he's a second-string corner. I think those guys are going to get on the field this weekend a lot, get them ready for the Miami game in the heat. Safety, they'll need some help back there with some other guys. You know, Emmanuel Flowers played a little bit, but I think there's a drop-off when you when you go from those guys. I mean, Tate Halleck, Flowers, the safety situation, uh, kind of unproven for Michigan State. And when they get in the heat down in Miami, they're going to need those those guys to play. And Angelo Gross, we saw that. We mentioned it here uh, oh, and over at SpartanMag.com, the open practice that took place over at, at Spartan Stadium about two weeks ago, there was a deep pass to Jalen Naylor, and um, Angelo Gross also was influenced up a little bit on that one. So Gross is going to get tested. He's going to get tested in the middle, and he'll learn as he goes. They love him as a player, but that's all part of getting better as a football team, and that's one reason I really liked the, the Iowa Hawkeyes this year, and I put a post about them two weeks ago over at the Underground Bunker message board. Iowa is always tricky and physical with their defense, and they run those two deep zones and other zones um, with tight, small windows. 
the Hawkeyes do. I think they play man to man on third down a little bit too much because their their zones are it's the tight windows. They close on you. They hit you. They've been doing it that way for years. Going back to Norm Parker and now with Phil Parker, tough situation. This happens to be an Iowa team that returned all four defensive backs, including one or two that have gotten some All Big Ten mention, and they returned their middle linebacker. You know that those are uh, well schooled film rats that played for Iowa, and I didn't even have to watch Iowa play. You knew coming into week one that their defensive backfield was going to be tricky and tough. I haven't watched that game yet. I don't know how Penix did, but you know, surprised that they blew Iowa, uh, Indiana out a little bit, kind of. I, I, wasn't, I wasn't shocked. I was like, wow. But I wasn't like, holy crap. I was like, oh, we've seen Iowa do that to other teams there in Iowa City. With Indiana, I've been saying it for a long time, that that coordinator they had last year, Kane Womack, a young coordinator who's now head coach, I think, at South Alabama. He was terrific last year. They did not have great talent at Indiana, but they played terrific football collectively, and they changed the pictures on you. And made you read some strange hieroglyphics back there and stayed on the same page. Led the Big Ten in sacks without having any NFL pass rushers that I'm aware of. I, I can double-check that, but they did a lot with X's and O's. Not only the X's and O's, but Indiana did. But uh, getting their guys on the same page with a lot of varied looks. Anyway, so grow, you know Michigan State's got to get better there. Got to get better there quickly. And uh, all right, so Matthew Johnson also says, who stood out that was not expected to get on the field? You know, I've got to mention Luke Campbell. I was not expecting him to get on the field. He got out there, did a solid job, was playing right tackle on the third possession of the game, I think, then went over to left tackle. He played both offensive tackles and was, was sturdy, moving his feet, did a good job. So that's one that surprised me. Cal Halliday, I didn't know he was going to be starting. At the open practice, he repped with the ones, and we talked about that at SpartanMag.com. We weren't really sure what that meant. Well, we know now what it meant. It, meant, it means he was legitimately a number one, a first string. And Noah Harvey repped with the threes that day, and we heard and talked a little bit that uh, you know they were cross-training him to learn a little bit at the weak side. But, but actually, he was a three that night, and he was a three against Northwestern. I'm really surprised about that. But Halliday... Not surprised he got on the field. He was very noisy in that spring scrimmage, played really well, and then repped with the ones at the open practice. So not a huge surprise, but, man, he was solid out there. He was solid in the spring game. He was solid against Northwestern. Talked to him after practice today, and he said, you know, coming out of the winter into the spring, he felt that he was just starting to get to that next level in terms of understanding the scheme and being able to play without thinking and just going on instinct. So he's at that stage now. Was not there last year. Didn't play any downs last year at linebacker. He played special teams, but did not see one snap of action at linebacker. But doing pretty good. Not the biggest guy, so you're going to have to hope that there's some durability there. Now let's go back to that mailbag. We're talking about Cal Halliday as a player a little bit. Jacqueline, Jacqueline, Macklin JB's question for Rochester, Michigan. He says, outside of running backs, which unit were you most impressed with, offense or defense against Northwestern? You know, I'm not going to say linebackers, but Halliday was a guy I was impressed with. But you're asking for which unit. I'm going to say wide receivers made some catches, but also wide receiver blocking. Jalen Naylor dropped one pass that was thrown a little bit behind him on a third down. Would have been a difficult grab, but you kind of need him to do that. But wide receiver blocking. I'll say wide receivers is the unit I was most impressed with. You could say offensive line also, but I'm going to say wide receivers, not only making some plays down the field. Now, I mean, they didn't have some big plays deep. You know, they was it Naylor that was open once deep, and Thorne missed him. Um, early in the game, Jaden Reed with a nice catch along the sidelines on like a hitch and go that was well covered, gave him a 50-50 ball. Jaden Reed went up and made a difficult catch in a crowd. And... I think it was a third down on a on a deep out route to Trey Mosley. Mosley made that one-handed catch. So you got some wide receivers making some big plays, but also making some big blocks. Jaden Reed with two blocks on the first play of the game, 75-yard touchdown by um, Kenneth Walker the third. And we are we're 30 minutes into the YouTube live tonight. That's the first time that we mentioned first time that we mentioned Kenneth Walker the third Big Ten offensive. Player of the week. Tremendous. Let's take a look at, at, at this one real quick. 
All right, I'm, you've seen this a number of times, but focusing on the wide receiver, top of your screen, the left wide receiver, that's Jaden Reed. Michigan State doing a lot of damage with these semi-closed formations with the reduction of these wide receivers with the, with the tight splits. So Jaden Reed, watch the wide receiver. All right, so the corner smells run. Corner's coming in, stalking that thing, and uh, Jaden Reed ends up essentially giving him a stalk block. Crack. So, and he does it with some physicality. This is what I like. Jaden Reed was not satisfied or finished with this. He makes that block and does not hang around for the receipt. In, in other words, he's not like looking, looking like pro, proud of himself. He finishes this block and looks to make another one. Watch Jaden Reed. He makes this block and goes looking for another one. And he sees this inside linebacker coming, getting loose from Horst a little bit, lowers his shoulder against a linebacker, and pop. 40, knocks him down almost. That block, 40 still stumbling. That's the one that turned it loose. Two blocks on one play by wide receiver. First play of the game. One more time, Jaden Reed. Boom and bap. What this is, this is relentless football, ladies and gentlemen. Boom, bap. That's relentless football. When Mel Tucker talks about relentless football, that's a dude making a block, and it's not just any dude, it's a guy that was an excellent receiver at Western Michigan, excellent receiver last year, wide receivers sometimes get a bad rap for being a little bit in the prima donna category, not this guy, not for this turn, not for this program right now, you get a boom, and a bap, and bada bing, here comes Walker down the sideline, you know the rest of the story, so, I, you know, relentless is not just a buzzword, talking about this with Conan Dyke today, relentless, relentless, you know, I mean, Tucker's serious about implementing those things into the program. And when you see something like that, that is a reflection of it. And blocking like that, and I can show you some other ones by other guys. Connor Hayward had one around the goal line. Um, those are not things that you put in a, in a game plan like that week or that day. Hey, Jaden, how about you block really good today? We're going to run this inside zone. Block someone really well today. No. That's a 10-month thing. That's a 12-month thing. That's a 48-month construct. That's relentless football. And like Tucker says, you got to play this way or you don't play. Or you, you're, you're not going to stay here long. That's at that one position. And he's, Tucker's a big, uh, one of his big sayings is you can judge the physicality of a team by how physical their wide receivers are on offense and how physical their corners are on defense. That's that extra, that icing on the, the cake. The, uh, it's the extra mile. It's the details. And when I saw that, I was like, oh, oh, okay. If we continue to see that, I think we will. At other positions, and you see some improvements, some same pages in the defensive backfield, then um, it, it'll really bode well, not only for this team, but for the, it'll bode well for the habits that are being instilled in the culture of the football and that's being played and the brand of football. You know, Mel Tucker talks about the brand of football that Michigan State fans can be proud of. When we talk about brand, we're not talking about marketing and so forth. We're talking about blocking and tackling with physicality and doing it correctly. First string, second string, third string, everybody supporting each other. Not jumping around and taunting and all that stuff. Getting a job done and being happy with it. That is a brand of football. It's a culture. And you could see it being instilled in that game for 60 minutes. It was good. Not everybody was going 100 miles an hour all the time. I saw some guys that... Um, Eased up once or twice. Quiveris Crouch has to break some habits in that area. When he turned it loose and was able to go sideline to sideline or get into the backfield, you saw the talent flash. But he's he has to uh, he's in the process of being reprogrammed also because all these guys are st still somewhat new to the program. Question number three: MSU Polo from Rockford, Michigan says it appeared that Northwestern focused on protecting quarterback Hunter Johnson with extra blockers and relatively quick throws. Was that your observation? And do you have any other insight on the Michigan State pass rush? We talked about a little bit of this already tonight. Panishuk, it seems like if an offensive lineman gets his hands on him, he kind of stalls. He needs to f find a way to defeat those blocks and get him, make himself small and dip a shoulder and uh, combat those hands and, and, and get it done. Need that from him. Beasley was okay. He's going to be okay. Uh, Drew Jordan, I mentioned, his takeoff was all right. Um, I think that first drive... Drew Jordan had a good pass rush, had a rip move, turned the corner, okay, almost got home on one. Drew Jordan did. Um, Drew Jordan, there was a first and 10 to the 13-yard line late in the first half. He two-gapped the tight end, quickly got off of that, laid out, and made the tackle. Played quick. That was for a gain of two. 
Drew Jordan showing me a couple of things, already looking quicker than what I saw from him last year with his Duke film. Uh, I also gave him a plus. There was a, there was a play in which Drew, Drew, Drew Jordan recognized a screen pass, collision the running back, and the quarterback had to get rid of it. It was second and eight in the red zone. That was late in the first half. Drew Jordan, uh, you know, his pass rush, recognizes screen, collisions the, the running back before he gets too far downfield. You can do that. So smart play. Got that guy on the ground. Quarterback had to had to chuck it, had to ground it, because Drew Jordan did a good job playing the screen on that one. You know, Beasley had a quarterback hit, knocked down. That was third and down and seven in the first quarter. Crossed the face of two offensive linemen as part of a blitz. Rushed inside, got a knockdown of the quarterback incomplete. Didn't get a sack on that one, but Beasley's going to be active. Beasley's going to get some numbers this year in the pass rush. He's a good, important player. Didn't see much from Piotrowski. I know the coaches really love him and love his motor and everything. Did not play as many downs as Drew Jordan did, as many snaps. I would imagine Piotrowski is going to come to the forefront at some point, but I don't know, maybe I was expecting a little more suddenness out of him. We'll, we'll see. It's just one game. Not much of Michael Fletcher. Talked about that earlier. And Avery Dunn did not travel. I don't know what the word is on that. I know they were pretty happy with some of his progress. I don't know if he was dinged up or something. But Fletcher playing very few snaps. Again, that's a guy that had three sacks last year in limited time. Has added some strength and some size. Never been a guy, like I said, that could turn the corner. But a guy that can, who's been productive in, in limited minutes. But limited snaps this year for, uh, for this game for Fletcher. All right, let's go up here and see who's checking in. Angelo Gross, Harold Joyner enthusiast, was first in line. Congratulated, congratulations to him. Ty Garland checking in from Oak Park, Illinois. First time Tyrone Garland, originally from New Jersey. Legit Spartan dog, class of 1993 recruiting class. First time he's been in the starting five. Kenneth Roberts. Brian V says sup. Hayden Roberts says go green. That's your starting five. So where do I put Garland? I'm going to put Garland at the four. I know he's a little bit of an undersized linebacker, but I'm, I'm, I'll bet he can shoot. He's going to rebound. He's going to bang. He's going to run the floor. He's going to be stretch shooter, stretch four. I got Garland at the four. Angelo Gross, Harold Joyner, enthusiast. He's a youngster. I got him. I got him at the wing. I'm not going to ask him to be the point. Kenneth Roberts is the point, man. He's got the point. Brian V's in the middle. Hayden Roberts is at the other wing. So you got Gross, Roberts in the wing. Wait, I, I can't. I, I lost track. Roberts is running the point. Garland's the four. But Garland's the leading scorer as a stretch four. And he can guard anyone one through five. I know he's undersized linebacker, but if you got a six eight center, I don't care. I'm putting Garland on him. Elbows in the rib cage. And uh, bloody in some noses. That's starting five. Hayden Roberts from Lake Odessa. Drinking a Long Island. Good for you. Long Island iced teas. Remember those at Olga's back in the old days? A certain age, you know what I'm talking about. Brian V says, need to change my screen handle to Kenny Walker. Kenneth Walker, enthusiast. Detroit Spartan says, Harlem and Lake, Oak Park, Illinois. Love it. His old stomping grounds. Tyrone Garland with thumbs up. Detroit Spartan says, where's the Italian stallion? That must be me. I don't know if I'm a stallion, but thank you. Uh, Jeff Blanche, go green from Grand Rapids. Hayden Roberts, thoughts about Swag Surf replacing Thunderstruck. I love it. Is that actually happening? Clever comp, clever. Drinking a cold Sam Adams Oktoberfest. What about you, comp? I'm drinking water. I'll tell you what, though, I was, uh, I, ha I, I had a little bit of, um, Wolf's Head coffee flavored whiskey. I hope you don't hope that doesn't offend anybody. I'm not a big whiskey guy, but um, I was encouraged to try this when I was north of the border a couple weekends ago, and again this past weekend, and uh, it kind of kind of grew on me. And we got some of the duty free on the way home. Wolf's Head Distillery, uh, Harrow, Ontario, and. Um, when people try it, I, you know, some might be a little frou-frou for some people. Is Can whiskey be frou-frou? I don't know enough about that category. But when people try that, they're like, oh, man, that's interesting. So I got work to do tonight. Otherwise, you know, one of these days, maybe I'll bring out the wolf's head. There's a guy at the Auburn side that does one of these, and he, 
he um, put some pretty hard stuff on the rocks and is very entertaining. I am not a very good drinker, like I've said in the past. I'm not really, uh, it's not my thing. Not judging, just not very good at it. Brian V says, having a virgin Coke Zero tonight. Ready to hear about some Spartan football. Detroit Spartan says, comps coming out of the tunnel tonight, guaranteed. <laughs> yes, this, these posts were while we had the tent, we had the countdown clock going. Old Tug the Bell Cow is here. Matt Lord says, yo, first time live, long time listener. Thanks, Matt. Thanks for getting here and being a part of this nonsense. Speaking of which, I need to uh, alert the masses uh, out on Twitter to let people know that this nonsense is going on. Uh, Kenneth Walker, though, I tell you what, um, I had no idea that Walker was going to look that good. And we've talked about th- that this week. Uh, uh, Kenneth no, Walker old looked... Old the bell cow is here. Kenneth Walker looked good in that... In, in, in his Wake Forest video. But... Um, honestly, he didn't look that... He didn't look as good as he did Friday, Friday night. Oh... Who was it? Matthew Johnson? Let's see here. Is there a test? No, test. It, uh, sometimes it just goes. Wait. Test, test. We're good. Never a dull moment here at Spartan Mag Live, which is the Wayne's world of college football. All right, anyway, I forget what I was talking about, but let's go back to the questions. All right, uh, you know, getting back to MSU Polo's question about Northwestern, they did focus on protecting Johnson with extra blockers. There was some max protection going on. I didn't feel like it was all out max protection, you know, Mel Tucker mentioned that a little bit after the game. Not as max protect, not as max protective as we've seen maybe Wisconsin back in the old days. Uh, Kapilovic, I asked today, getting back to Kenneth Walker, I said, uh, did, I asked him, did was Kenneth Walker this fast and quick? Not only the top end speed, but the burst on the change of direction. And he says, I don't know, maybe he is quicker and faster and stronger. You'll have to ask him. And I plan to ask him. I didn't get a chance to ask him, though. He was over there. I was talking to Kapilovic. He was over there talking with some other reporters. I had a recorder over there, but I didn't get to ask him that. I wanted to ask him that right after the game. I'm just curious about that. I'm not even sure if he would acknowledge that, but I swear he's he came to Michigan State as a good running back, but he's better now. And that strength conditioning program at Michigan State and nutrition, I think it's made him a better player. Question number four, Jim from Temecula, California. Jim has posted before, and I can never figure out how to pronounce that that town in California, Temecula. He said, what should the entrance song be? It seems most agree that Thunderstruck has run its course and should get replaced. Curious what your opinion is. Yeah, the, the entrance song at Spartan Stadium, that was something that was discussed the last day or so over at the Underground Bunker message board. A lot of maggers posted some of the songs that they would like to see Michigan State use. Some of them were interesting choices. Some were terrible choices. As a joke, I posted Dust in the Wind. It's a joke. Um, You know, someone posted Lose Yourself by Eminem. And... Eminem, I think his, that his daughter his daughter was a cheerleader at Michigan State or his sister was or something like that. So there's a little bit of a connection. Also, a few years ago, if you called the Michigan State basketball office, if they put you on hold, you would hear Lose Yourself. That was the, the music that they had. A little Michigan State connection there. And it's a song a lot of people are familiar with. It's intense. It's got a very driving, building uh, beat to it, which could work pretty well. I, I went back and listened to that song again today, thinking about a team about to take the field, and I and I don't think I don't think it would work all that well, because lose yourself. Um, the first verse when he gets into the lyrics, it's it's not about football, and it doesn't have to be about football, but it doesn't it, it's it's it can't really be applicable to football. It's about you know somebody who's very who's uh, doubting himself. And I'm not sure that works real well. Could you just 
take the lyrics out and just have that that uh, that guitar lick and the beat. Yeah, um, but the other, the other problem with that song in relation in, in terms of being a possible run out of the tunnel song is or pre tunnel song is uh, that the music doesn't actually build. It does, but it's it's the it's the lyrics, it's the vocals that really gets that song going. And I think for a good tunnel song, you need the the, the instrumentals. You need the you need the hard guitar to build and build and build, like you know, Thunderstruck builds and builds and builds. You know, and Enter Sandman, the the lyric is a background thing. It's the guitar that builds and builds. With Lose Yourself, it starts out real strong, but it's the vocals that build. And I don't know if you can have vocals be a vocal buildup can work as a as a run out song. And it's not really an entrance song. It's the song that they play before they come out. And when they come out of the tunnel, they play the fight song with the band, right? So I like the idea of Lose Yourself, but I'm not sure it's applicable. I went on YouTube today and I watched a couple of Thunderstruck uh, Michigan State tunnel entrances that Michigan State's fans have put on YouTube. And um, it's pretty good. It's good. You know, a lot of people are antsy. They want something better. There's better ways to do it, I would imagine. But I'm not the biggest fan of the song Thunderstruck, but I think it works pretty well. And I'm I'm a crotchety old... You know, I like the I like the old metal stuff. I'm I like that type of music. I like a lot of music, but I, I so I'm not somebody that's down on that song because of that genre of music. I like that genre of music. I think Enter Sandman works really well. At Iowa, they played Back in Black, which is a little bit overdone in a lot of ways uh, over the years, but it works well there, and they rally around it pretty well. At Wisconsin, they they use Where the Streets Have No Name, which is not as aggressive of a song, but it's a, almost like an emotional like. Uh, nostalgic type of song, and they play that while they play some old video of old Wisconsin great moments, and it works pretty well. Where the Streets Have No Name has also been used by the Vancouver Canucks without the lyrics, but just a loop of the uh, the guitar intro, and it works great for the Canucks when they're when they're uh, get it rolling and during the Stanley Cup playoffs. Great. I mean that's been done. So I mean that's. That's not like a real hard driving metal song, but it works well. And Wisconsin is kind of a little bit of a different community there. I love it. Um, works well for them. So Michigan State, I looked into Lose Yourself, and I, I was I was leaning toward advocating that one, but uh, I don't think it works. So swag surfing is really really uh, the thing. This guy Ultimate Sparty Podcast is saying swag surfing is happening. Is this? Oh, that that's just what what is this happening? I mean, this guy wants it to be the case. I, you know, sometimes I turn this thing on and um and news breaks, and I'm not aware of it. Anyway, I don't have a real strong opinion on that. I do think that uh, Michigan State has struck a chord with playing "Don't Stop Believing." I know that that's kind of a cliche song, but it's it's a good sing-along song. It's also been good with the Red Wings. And they played it, the Northwestern game. Michigan State was playing really well. And they played that, I don't know, was it fourth quarter at some point? Michigan State fans were so vocal at Evanston. You did a great job, those of you that were there. It was noticeable. At one point, Michael Dowell, Michigan State's nickelback, early in the game was telling the Michigan State fans to get up. I don't think I've ever seen a Michigan State player in a road game telling fans to get up. He did, I don't know if it had an impact on the field or not, but that was something I've never seen before. So they played Don't Stop Believing. You know that part where they say, born and raised in South Detroit. Of course, there is no South Detroit. But when they do that, you know, Michigan Ganders belt loudly into that particular verse. So that can, can kind of work. You know, like at Pittsburgh and some others, they play Sweet Caroline for no good reason. But that song, Don't Stop Believing, which everybody likes, but Michigan Ganders specifically like that for that reason even though it's geographical error but we'll we'll let that slide um so i think that that playing that not as an opening song but like you know first stoppage of the third quarter first stoppage of the fourth quarter that type of thing kind of like a wisconsin between the third you know they have jump around between the third the third and fourth quarter but wisconsin also does fill me up buttercup like early in the fourth quarter and by that time, those guys are, those fans are really well lubricated on whatever they smuggled into the stadium. 
And that works really well, too. For an oldie, uh, you know, kind of a dorky song. It's a good song, but kind of dorky at a football game, right? And they go crazy with it. That's, that's, that's Madtown for you. They, they play three songs really well at Wisconsin games. It's a, it's, it's a great atmosphere. Less of a tailgate environment, more of a pregame bar thing. I think it's, it's almost like more of an NFL thing, pregame, because it's bars. You know, some of that Chicago influence. I don't know. Madison's great. All right. So, uh, oh, and SCM345, also on the message board today, says, he says, hey, Jim, what are your thoughts about a new entrance song? My choice is Kick, uh, Kickstart My Heart by Motley Crue. What do you think? Thunderstruck has run its course in my eyes. So interestingly, here's someone who likes Kick, Kickstart My Heart by Motley Crue, but does not like Thunderstruck. If he likes Motley Crue, he obviously enjoys metal, but he's, he feels it's run its course. The whole idea of something having run its course, it's interesting that so many people, I, I never really loved Thunderstruck to begin with, but I've been surprised that the, I think the crowd responds pretty well to it. You know, when they, when the Spartan guy brings out a sword and cuts through the logo of the other team, the crowd erupts. That's effective. That's pretty good. And the way that song builds, it, it I can see why somebody at some point years ago said, hey, Michigan State should start using this, and they did it. I can see why they chose that one. But a lot of fans out there think that it's run its course. The problem is it'd be really easy to choose a bad one. So I know um, Crowley Sullivan was a good friend of mine, colleague, uh, had a, a podcast with Mel Tucker last year in June, and he was mentioning that he wanted to see Get Down On It. Was it cool in the game that it get down on it? And I, you know, I, I, I was kind of like that song, whatever, back in the old days. But I listened to it again as, a, as an entrance song. My friend Crowley, I'm, I'm, just, I'm not feeling that for an entrance song. But a lot of people have an opinion on this. And I'm not, it, and whatever, if, if it gets replaced and something else is used, um, half the people won't like it, no matter what it is. Remember when Maurice Ager came out with a beat that was like Spartans, Spartans, whatever that was? That wasn't too bad, you know? But Kickstart My Heart's not a bad one. I know a lot of people on our message board were like, man, those songs that everybody's posting, that's those are only good if you're like 50 and older. Um, but and then other people were like, hey, man, I've, I've got teenage kids and they like hard rock or classic rock or metal. So I'm not... Sure, it's a uh, it's a, it's a generational problem. I don't think you have to go with something that was recorded in the last ten years. Um, and the the thing is done to hype up the the, the fans, right? Because the players are in the tunnel; they just they can feel a beat, they can hear a beat, and they can hear the crowd. Then they come out of the fight song. So it's not like the the players are going to get into that song. Maybe the ones near the entrance of the tunnel can hear it a little bit. So, and like Big Movie said, Big Movie. Spartan Dog, official former Michigan State player. He says it's for the fans. The players can get pumped up. This is for the fans. So, Kickstart My Heart is, is a good song. Uh, I, I've never been accused of having the greatest musical taste. But I do like that song. In that video, I remember they just had, you know, terrible car accidents and, you know, auto racing accidents. Top fuel funny cars, right? And some crazy uh, accidents. So, I mean, some, uh, you know, you, it's a song about speed. So, you could, uh, you could, you could apply some football highlights to that pretty creatively. I think that would work. And if Michigan State had done that 14 years ago or 15 years ago, however long ago it was when they started with, with Thunderstruck, if they'd have gone kickstart my heart by now, would people like that more? Would that have worked real well? I don't know. I know it's important, but I don't have an answer on that one. Like I said, I, I didn't think kickstart, I didn't think Thunderstruck was great. I was like, man, that's not even really a great ACDC song, but whatever. But the way it builds, and but I've always been su surprised that the crowd kind of gets into it a little bit. And in terms of something running its course, you have to be careful with that because traditions are made to build and build and build and People just get used to it and run its course. Last time I heard it, we'll, we'll see how it, how it plays this year if they have it because fans have been out for a long time. But it's been pretty good. Anyway, uh, Donovan Thomas says, wait, are we changing the entrance? No, I, I'm not. Mel Tucker is has his ears open on it. And he's got, and he's he wants to see 
he's got his ears open on everything, and so does Alan Haller. So a couple nights ago on the Underground Bunker Message Board, this topic came up. It's something that Michigan State fans are discussing a lot. Uh, it's it's not as if it's like on it's happening, but it's kind of always on the table. Kind of like kind of like you know conference expansion. It's just kind of always a, po- a possibility. Question number five. Have I been going too long with some of this stuff? Well, I just sent that tweet out. People came in and probably looking for us to talk some football, and we're talking about music intros. But we know that it's important for Michigan State fans. That's why we're talking about it. If you want to rewind, we had some real football at the beginning. Let's get back into real football right now. Go ahead and post some questions over in the comment area. Right now I'm getting to the mailbag questions, questions that were posted at the Underground Bunker message board over at SpartanMag.com. If you're just joining us, my name is Jim Caproni, publisher of SpartanMag.com. It's the Michigan State website for Rivals.com. It is the church of what's happening now with Michigan State sports. It's the daily narrative. Go check it out. Become a subscriber for free for a month. Go check it out. Question number five, Bleb Love from Rochester Hills, Michigan says, did Friday night's game change your win-loss expectations for this team? If I remember correctly, last week you were thinking around 6-6 six and six for Michigan State. Yes, um, and I think uh, Don from DeWitt also had the same question. Yeah, you know, I was thinking six and six. That's without even knowing who the quarterback was. Quarterback comes in, plays pretty sharp. Not only did he make hit some nice passes, didn't really hook up with the deep ball, but made some good uh, decisions. Not only with wh- whom to throw to, and accurately, but calm in doing so and moving in the pocket to give himself a chance to do so. Feeling some rush uh, when there was some rush. Also, the, you know, the the zone read, you know, leaving the defensive end unblocked, reading him, leaving it with, you know, pulling it out when the guy crashed on Walker too much, and then leaving it with Walker when the guy honored Thorne. So using Thorne on the keepers was good. And some RPO game. One or two of those runs, they had a pass play sewn in, and there was one pass where they threw it at least once when they when they threw it for like a little seven, eight-yard gain when he could have left it in for a run play and an RPO. So I thought that his zone read decisions and his RPO decisions were good. And there were other there were other plays. Well, let's let's look at some Thorn. Let's just let's just uh we're gonna go ahead and look at some video if you guys don't mind. I've got some Thorn, got some thoughts on this. Alright, that was the first play of the game. We showed that earlier with Jane Reed and that great block. And you've seen this one a few times. Some extra speed there from Kenneth Walker. The third, number seven all-time single-game rushing performance. All right, this was Northwestern's first drive, I think. This is a third down. This is a sprint out. Actually, this was uh, direct snap, running back, tail, direct snap to the tailback. Uh, Dowell, number seven, lining up as a basically like a, a 4-3 linebacker. Dowell, up there at the far hash, is going to defeat the block of a tight end, number 80. Dowell right there at the 21-yard line is engaging with the tight end. This is nickel versus tight end. Nickel versus tight end. That's one of the big questions. If you're going to have a four-two-five, can your five, your fifth guy, your nickel, can he withstand a Big Ten blocking tight end? Now, might not be the best blocking tight end you're going to see all year, but right here, Dowell at the 21-yard line, sheds the block, converges, makes the tackle. Nice play there by Dowell. You guys want to do this some more? Under center. Michigan State ran this formation a lot in this night. When they went under center, had tight end to, tight end in the wing, both on the same side of the field. Tyler Hunt down in a three-point stance, and Hayward as a wing. As a play, counter boot roll to Hayward, diving catch on second and eight, really fueled Michigan State's second drive. Also, Hayward comes back with a catch on third down right here. Oh, it's later. What's this one? That was that hitch. We talked about that earlier in the in the broadcast tonight hitch and go they didn't bite in press coverage the corner didn't bite because he didn't see because he's in press hitch just puts up a 50 50 ball in second and 10 and jane jane and reed goes up and catches a 50 50 ball nice play eh? okay i don't know if you remember some of these plays or not this is the third and seven four deep by northwestern got to throw underneath I mean, you can throw. I, mean, I know that my friend Rico Beard. These type of things drive him crazy. He used, to, he used to drive him crazy with Steve Mariucci that the Lions would throw short as part of the West Coast offense. But if you got four deep back here and it's early in the game, 
you don't throw into the teeth of the coverage. It's okay to throw downfield and throw beyond the sticks. Everybody, a lot of people are like, it's third and seven, throw beyond the sticks no matter what. And my answer to that is always, well, how many interceptions do you want to throw? Ball security is job security. Ball security is big, so check it down, see if he can make someone miss. Over to Hayward, makes one miss, breaks another tackle, drags him, big play, moves the chains, sets up a 14-0 lead. Connor Hayward at his new position, having a big impact on Michigan State taking that lead. What was this? So that was that was uh, that's one of the RPOs. You've got a bubble down here. To, you got trips to the right. Mesh. He's reading. He's reading the overhang defenders. He can shoot it out there to the number three receiver on a bubble if he wants to. Leaves it in his gut. And for Northwestern, you've got they don't fill the gap. All right. So 87 Hunt. He's going to seal someone to the outside. Horse seal one to the inside. The player back there at the 14-yard line, top of your screen, Northwestern player, I, I assume he's responsible for that gap, and he's late. And now he's not going to tackle him in the open space. I guess he does get the tackle, saves a touchdown, but um, just didn't get the gap filled. Now watch Connor Hayward. We were talking about relentlessness earlier. Watch Connor Hayward here coming under center again with, with the wing and the tight end in the same position. Uh, split zone, wham block. He's going to get a decent piece of the unblocked edge man of the line of scrimmage and man of the line of scrimmage. Number 11, Hayward. Decent piece of him here, but relentlessness, just like Jaden Reed. Connor Hayward gets a decent piece of him and goes to look to set another block. There goes Hayward looking to set another block. Gets 16. Let's watch that again. This is a brand of football. This is cultural. This is relentlessness. Pop. Bap blocking two guys in the same play. You can watch a lot of football for a lot of teams, and that's not going to be seen very often. What do we have here? All right, let's dig too deep. All right, oh, I like this one. The original question was about Thorne. Now you've got a bailing quarters zone. He looks to the right, and you've got like a little bit of uh, you've got a hitch and a fade which is kind of a, a smash concept for man-to-man or cover two. This is cover four. He's looking over there and sees it's cover four. That route combination on the right is not going to work. He's got two deep. That means middle of the field is open. So he looks there. That's not going to work. Comes back to his crossers. There's your dig. You got one. You got another one. And layers. Finds him. There he is. Middle of the field open between the safeties. That was processing the information quickly. It's harder to do if the coverage is tighter and the pass rush is, great, is good, but that he threw with some poise there, going through his progressions, making the right decision. What's this one? All right, Cal Halliday making a play here. Halliday is a guy that played small town in Pennsylvania where they rarely threw it. Watch 27. Drops into zone coverage, reads screen, number 27, and... Quick feet converging quickly and kind of avoids a blocker to make a tackle. Just a nosy guy. What do we have here? Split zone, play action. All right, here's where Thorne steps up, delivers to Mosley. This is one Tucker really liked because he feels some rush. Who was it was getting beat? Okay, Horst was kind of getting beat to the outside. Campbell does a pretty good job over at right tackle on this one. Luke Campbell is at right tackle. Down and low and moving. Punch. Moving his feet. So 62, Campbell's okay. Horse kind of gets beat by 99, who's a good pass rusher. I think that's 99. But but uh, what Tucker likes about this is the subtle movement. Play action. Freezes the linebacker for a moment. Steps up and keeps his shoulders and feet correct. From the right hash to the far sideline. Pretty good strike. Mosley getting his feet down. That's just kind of a difficult team to defend to defense right there. You get a little bit of a pass rush. Quarterback still makes a play. What's this? Pistol again. That's the zone read keep. All right, so those you got most of you guys know what zone read is. The defensive end, the right defensive end, they leave him unblocked. See the purple shirt right there, number five, unblocked at the 45 yard line. Quarterback reading him. Is the is the is the unblocked man keying in on the on the running back or the quarterback? You can see by his shoulder attitude, he's keying in on the running back more so than the quarterback. So he pulls it out. 
Defensive end bites on the tailback, takes the cheese. You got Reed down here with an angle to block number to block someone. Actually, it's it's is that Hayward that blocks him. Reed's gonna get a block. You have Hayward and Reed, a couple of blocks, got an alley, and you got Bergen with a personal foul. Big play to set up uh Michigan State's third touchdown. This was the screen pass, I think. Samak at center getting out with a nice block. Samak coming down with a nice block right there. And Jordan Simmons getting in on the fun 21-0 in Evanston. All right, what's it? I, we're talking about um, Thorne. Some of those were. Maverick Hanson, a good job here. Michigan State did less two-gapping in this game than they did last year. But on this play, Hanson, two gaps, the right guard. The rest of the guys on this snap are not two-gapping, doesn't look like. You got Mallory getting into a gap. One gapping and outside rush. But you see Hanson, number 97, both hands on the right guard, ready to play either side of that guard. Two gapping. He's playing both gaps. Reads it. Sees the ball tuck inside. Disengages. Makes the tackle for loss. Nice play by Maverick Hanson there coming off the bench. What do we have here? All right, fourth down. All right, this was their first touchdown. I talked to Cal Halliday about this a little bit today. I'll go ahead and play it once, and then we'll... Uh, Talk about what went wrong. Wide open, coverage bust. Halliday said, you know, we should we talked about it at halftime. We should we still should have gotten it done. We still should have covered it. But Mel Tucker was talking about unscouted looks. When you're playing a football game, you'll see an unscouted look once in a while. Something you did not prepare for. And this was something they didn't prepare for. It's a good play by Northwestern. Fourth and goal, Michigan State being very stout inside the five yard line, not giving up uh, much between the tackles. So Northwestern is a compliment to Michigan State. Goes to the air here. All right, so so Northwestern is loaded up with beef. They've got one, two, three tight ends. Five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. Yeah, three tight ends. So Michigan State counters with one, two, three, four, five down linemen. Six if you count Chase Klein as a linebacker with his, with his hand in the dirt. Six down linemen. It's goal line defense. So... They've got all these tight ends in, so Michigan State takes corner backs off the field. So Michigan State has extra beef, extra linebackers, so they've got no corners. There's no corners. Michigan State with one, two, three, four, five, six, seven across the front line, and you've got linebackers back here, Harvey, Van Summeren, and Halliday. And the one defensive back that they have is Xavier Henderson. So... Good play design here by Northwestern. Okay, we're going to put in a lot of beef. They're going to take their corners out. We are going to motion a guy. You can play a lot of football, and you won't see Xavier Henderson have to run run with a motion, with a motioning receiver. So the receiver goes in motion. Henderson goes with him. It's not something Henderson does very often. That declares man to man. Of course, it's man to man. You, you, I don't know. You only got one wide receiver. I don't know. So the question is, when you're deciding who covers whom, it's going to be 27 or Henderson is going to cover the the motioning receiver and it's timed you know okay so Halliday at pre-snap the reason this is confusing at pre-snap number I think that's number 80 the widest the widest tight end Halliday has the widest tight end he has number one number one being the receiver that's furthest to the outside at this time this is the tight end that is furthest wide and so 27, Halliday has that tight end. So over on this side of the field, Halliday whoever be, has whoever becomes the number one. If the, if the tailback goes out for a pass he, and he becomes number one as the widest receiver, then 27 takes the tailback. All right, so they motion the receiver. Now the receiver comes into play, the motioning receiver. So now who is the widest receiver right now? You've got the motioning receiver, and you've got the tight end releasing. And they still haven't declared who is the widest, who's number one. They're still on the same plane. So 27-3, and three, that's Halliday and Henderson, have to read that simultaneously, the, exactly the same, in an instant. And, it's, and on top of that, you know, Tucker says you have to play your rules. If you see an unscouted play, this is an unscouted play, you have to play your rules. So Halliday... Goes to number one as the as the motioning receiver. He thinks that that is the outside threat, and so does Henderson. Henderson had him in man to man because he's motioning with him. So Henderson right right here is thinking, I've got the motion man, I've got the motion guy, I've got the motion guy. All right, so Henderson never has to run with the motioning receiver. Henderson and Halliday rarely have to decipher between themselves who has number one. Good play by Northwestern. So no one ends up 
actually no one ends up getting the the no one ends up covering the motion man either. The motion man is kind of open also because Halliday takes him for a moment and lets him go to, to Henderson and nobody has the tight end. So Halliday and Henderson were both upset with themselves about that. They talked about it during halftime and, and, and Halliday told me today, he says, that shouldn't have happened. We got it straightened out. But that's what happens in college football. You're going to face something that's unscouted with some wrinkles and things like that and have to rely on on rules, and uh, it was a big big play for Northwestern. It was well devised, but you can see the, the timing of the receiver and when the ball was snapped, making it confusing as to who the number one receiver is. So the question was about Peyton Thorne, and those you, you saw some Peyton Thorne decisions in there. There were some other ones, but I don't want to go too long with the video. But the question was... Um, all right, wait, well, the question was, uh, uh, actually that was from the chat area. The question from Bebel from Rochester Hills was, did the Friday's game change my win and loss expectations for this team? He says, if I remember correctly, last week you were thinking 6-6. Six and six. And yes, better than 6-6 six and six now because last week we didn't even know who the quarterback was. Now we've seen the quarterback, and the quarterback's pretty good. We've seen the running back. The running back's better than I thought. The offensive line we thought could be good. We see that it is pretty good. It's got to, they got to do it week after week. But the, there are... Um, indications that that's a pretty good offensive line. Trey Mosley told said today that he was playing hurt last year. So you've got Trey Mosley joining Naylor and Reed as terrific wide receiver threats to the point where I, I wouldn't be surprised if Mosley outproduces Naylor this year. So Mosley's good. Halliday's good. You have to get better at safety. All right. So the Northwestern game I thought was a coin flip. So I had Michigan State at six and six. So now one of those coin flips goes in Michigan State's favor. So now, yeah, six and a half or to to five and a half, but you can't go six and a half and and five and a half. So I'll move that to seven and five. Which if I think they can be seven and five, that means they can still also go five and seven or nine and three. And it's a margin of error of plus or minus two. But I don't see this team going five and seven as long as everybody stays healthy and that culture remains strong. So. Also, Indiana does not look as good all of a sudden, right? Michigan looks good for a week. We'll see. Michigan, maybe Michigan will be, will be pretty good this year. I don't know. We'll see what happens against Washington, who lost to Montana. Um, Penn State, I mean, who knows what they're going to look like by the time we get to Thanksgiving, but Penn State with a nice win at Wisconsin to pull that one out, and Wisconsin just kind of not getting it done. So I'll, I'll, I'll bump it up to 7-5. and five. But we're still learning about this team, and the ceiling uh, could be even higher than that. Uh, Big Don f- says, what qualities are you most impressed with with Tucker and also Alan Haller? You know, Tucker, I've talked about this before. You know, he's a, he's a vast package. He's got the X's and O's background. He's got this general intelligence as a human being. He's a hard worker. He's got a lot of ambition. I mean, he, want, he doesn't want to just be good. He wants to be great. Um. He's got high confidence and belief in himself and his knowledge of the game as he should. And he's got a resume that was built around great ones. He's learned from great ones. And he's a, he's a commanding presence, an alpha dog presence, which is, which is wonderful. Um, the, you know, assistant coaches and recruits respond well to that. But he also has an approachable personality, very fun personality, something that D'Antonio might have had if you got to know him real well. But, you know, it's kind of not as approachable. Tremendous person. But Tucker, you know, just really gregarious in a lot of ways. You know, John L. Smith was that way too. But John L. Smith didn't have that commanding elf of dog presence, among other things. But Tucker, I mean, he's got this intelligence. He's got this X's and O's. He's an alpha dog, but he's also approachable. He's got, and he's a salesman too. You heard the uh, he, he's a, he was a great recruiter at Georgia. I think he's going to prove to be a good recruiter at Michigan State, potentially a great one if they start winning. Um, and he's got an understanding of modern trends and pop culture and social media, and uh, that works well. And also he can get guys, players, into a frame that makes them want to kick butt collectively for the team, for themselves. you got to kick butt or you can't play here type of thing. Win collisions, be relentless, all those things. So I mean it's 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 a total package right now and if they can if they can get to where week after week they're in you know tip top yeah you know, that was there was a lot of tip top in that game against Northwestern just well orchestrated well organized tip top offensive line route combinations quarterback 
uh, you know, in the defensive back seven, there's a lot of new faces there, and you, you see some errors there. That's got to get straightened out. And uh, if they make progress there, it's only week one, but if they make progress there and they can stay tip-top to go with all those other things, it's you, you're getting into the potential of total package territory. In terms of Alan Haller, he has the general intelligence too. He's a listener and a sponge. He learns. That's how he's gotten to where he's, he, he is. He's like, he's watched, learned, applied it, and he's been a sponge and is built on it. D'Antonio says he's a team guy. Uh, he's a guy that's like, what can I do for you type of guy. D'Antonio feels that Haller, Alan Haller will do well with the donors. And that's why D'Antonio recommended him as part of that advisory c- committee. Um, do we have that clip? Let's see here. Mark D'Antonio yesterday. The longer it went for myself, it became more you know, that he fit the profile of what we were looking for. You know, when you start checking all the different boxes of what you wanted, he was checking all those boxes. You know, I think he's an incredible man. Uh, I've gotten to know him over the course of time, more as a person um, that supported me from an athletics, assistant athletic director standpoint. But um, he was just a unique individual, and, and I, as I said earlier, he's a team guy. When you think about, about Alan, he's all about the team. And this, is, this now is his team, and he, he will do an outstanding job, and I think a lot of people will uh, rally around him, especially the student athlete. All right, also, let's let's fast forward this to the one-minute mark. Now, here goes Tom Izzo. Watch Izzo to the left. Here's Izzo. Watch Izzo approach Alan Haller and give him a nice that. hug. They can look and say, I can dream, dream big, and I right can there. that. Right like, there. All right, so everybody's pulling in the same direction right now. I think Alan Haller is a, uh, a good person, a person that I've, I've gotten to know over the years. Um, a guy, I, I don't know if he listens to me or not, but he looks like he's listening to me. He gives me a lot of respect, and I, I appreciate that. He's got patience and time for people. And he's impressed a lot of people from an administrative standpoint up and down the roster at Michigan State. So a lot of uh, a lot of interesting firepower there for Michigan State. Some young guys that are l- eager to hit that gas pedal. Question number seven, John from Gross Point, Michigan says, is Kenneth Walker the third head and shoulders above Jordan Simmons and Elijah Collins? He says, that's what it looks like right now. He says, seems like his vision is much better. Or did he benefit from better blocking than the other running backs have had for the past seasons? If he's not in the game, should we expect a big decrease in production at running back if Kenneth Walker's not in the game? Good question. I think he is head and shoulders above those guys. Maybe if Eli Collins can get back to what he was two years ago, maybe it's not head and shoulders, maybe it's just head, but that vision, that cutting ability, the burst, he's got some strength to him also. He's not the easiest guy to tackle. Simmons can fit in and do some decent things, but you know Collins last year, every time Collins was in the game, I swear blocking was not good, and Collins did not have that type of blocking uh, in um, you know last year when he had... A short number of carries. He didn't have that type of blocking that Kenneth Walker had on Friday. And Kenneth Walker had good blocking, zone blocking for the most part, guys. But it's not like Michigan State was just steamrolling. He was finding the daylight. He was finding the daylight with that great vision and cutting ability. Rush for 264. I think with that same blocking, Jordan, Simmons, or Collins, I, I just think they would have rushed for about 150, which is a good number, but I think that Kenneth Walker is that much of a difference maker to answer your question. That's the way I read it. I could change my mind on that in the coming weeks, but that's the way it looks to me right now. Question number eight, Mike from Lansing, Michigan. He says, which offensive lineman played well in your eyes and who struggled at times? Who played well? Jarvis at right guard, J.D. Duplain at left guard. And I asked Pilvic about that today. I said, it looked to me like the guards... Didn't really have any negative plays. He said, yeah, the guards really didn't have any negative plays. Jarvis back in guard. That's his natural habitat. He was solid. Um, Matt Allen had one or two plays, maybe where he struggled. You know, uh, Tyler Hunt gave up a sack as a tight end. AJR Curry in the stat sheet was, uh, there was a sack. They, they, they gave Northwestern a sack. And Pro Football Focus charged a sack to AJR Curry also. And it was not a sack. It was a quarterback draw. It was down there in the red zone. Uh, You just got to look at the receivers. The receivers were not going out for a pass. They were blocking. And Michigan State had success with the quarterback draw last year against Northwestern with Rocky Lombardi. Something that we said in the pre-snap read, Northwestern's defense looked so good against 
Wisconsin the week before. This is last year's game. You know, Northwestern was number eight in the country, 6-0, and something like that. Their defense was very good and hard-hitting, very good linebackers. And I thought Michigan State, with their terrible offense last year, I was looking for things that they could work, and I said quarterback draw is something that could work on third down because they played a lot of man-to-man on third down. And Michigan State ran two or three quarterback draws in that game at big moments that were key. And we had that in the pre-snap read before the game. Michigan State ran two quarterback draws in this game. Didn't work as well. Different defensive coordinator for Northwestern, different strengths and weaknesses. But there was one play where they, down in the red zone, they ran a quarterback draw. didn't go anywhere. And they lost a couple yards. And they called it a sack. And then they charged it to our Curry. Our Curry was just pass protecting you know, then there's going to, be a, going to be a release for quarterback draw. So Pro Football Focus does a great job in a lot of ways. They've got a, a vast staff of people that spend a lot of time in a hurry getting those grades out. But that, that was not a sack. Things like that, once in a while, you'll see some of the errors. But in terms of who did not play well on the offensive line, you know, I think, you know, Allen is still getting there, but they love the way he can make calls and get them into the right plays. The quarterback has to do that, but the, the the center has a lot to do with it also uh, as well. I'm not sure, you know, in terms of climbing out to second level for combination blocks. I don't know if the center can have an impact on whether a play is run from the, to the right or the left. It's mainly pickups and, and that type of thing, and Allen is very good at that. You know, Horst was okay, not great, but uh, all in all, the offensive line was, was good. Gave up one sack, and they rushed for however many they rushed for. Question number nine, Sparty6686 from Parts Unknown says, Having looked at the film and, and broken down sports review, it seems to me that Covers Crouch really struggled in coverage and two-gapping run support similar to Harvey last season. Northwestern took advantage of that in the second half, he says, by blocking Halliday and forcing Crouch to make a play. Do you foresee other teams doing this? And if so, does Michigan State's defensive defense live and die by Crouch's play? I'm not sure if I if I agree with all of that. I do think that Crouch does not have a great handle on things just yet. He's only been around campus for four or five weeks, only been with the program four or five weeks. And there were times um, when he was maybe catching a little bit. There were times when he pulled the pin and, and ran sideline to sideline when you saw the ability. And he saw some good defensive ability, athletic ability, strength, all that stuff. And on his, he had a sack, did a real good job with an arm over move, closed. Almost, he was going for a sack, fumble on that. Didn't get the sack, didn't get the fumble, but get the, got the sack. You know, the 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 ability flashes. He just has to be sure of it all the time. And Michigan State did less two gapping in this game than they did, uh, you know, last year in most games. They did it a little bit, and they two gapped. Sometimes it looks to me like they'll two gap one or two guys, but not all four. That's something the Patriots have done in the past. I think it's commonplace with some programs now. But the first play of the second half. Northwestern, the running back, got loose for a 49-yard gain. Kalen Gervin turned and, and ran him down. On that play, Michigan State two-gapped, and it didn't work out so well. Slade two-gapped, but it's almost like he slid off and ended up one-gapping, but got some penetration. But sometimes when you get penetration, it ends up creating more daylight because all of a sudden you've taken an offensive lineman and moved him. Now there's a bigger gap there, and they inserted an H-back as a lead blocker right at Covera's crouch on that play. So now it's two-gapping, and crouch is not... If it's one gapping, he just has a gap and turns it loose and goes. When it's two gapping, it's more of a read and react. And a lot of good defenses do both. Michigan State's still trying to get there. You mentioned Noah Harvey struggled with that last year. On that play, Crouch is kind of reading and ends up being an old-fashioned isolation play. Is what it turns out to because that, that H-back, is it's, it's an isolation lead type of play. And Crouch has him and just kind of collisions him and gets blocked. He doesn't like win the collision and get to one side of it and leverage it to, to help or defeat the block. He just kind of catches the block. And Rucker, Rucker, um, Dowell was coming from the nickel from the other side, and the the umpire got in the way. So that kind of took, that kind of impeded Dowell's chance to get there. So they'll look at that and look at the film, and Crouch has got to learn to play that better, especially in a two-gapping situation. Crouch, the talent flashes, but you're exactly right. Um, there will be times when he's, thinking because he's still learning the system you're asking will there be times when teams scheme to that like block holiday and make crouch make a play well they're blocking holiday every play they're trying to block him every play they're trying to block you gotta you gotta put a hat on a hat so not the way you um described it but that's something michigan state is going to have to improve upon let's go here to the chat area go through some questions 
appreciate everybody playing along tonight. Got a pretty big crowd of Spartan fans on hand today. Getting excited to go 2-0 and possibly this week against Youngstown State. By the way, Youngstown State is 1-0 and with a 44-41 victory over Incarnate Word. That was an overtime, Incarnate Word. You know, Youngstown's been a great program over the years, but not real strong right now. Last last year, the FCS teams played in the spring, and Youngstown State went 1-6. They had a spring season, so they played seven games from February to April. So it's really strange to play a team that just played seven games in the spring. A lot of scouting. So Michigan State can do a lot of scouting on them <clears throat> based on the springs. They're not going to change a lot from the spring. Because they didn't graduate anyone from the spring. Or did they? They probably did have some seniors. But probably not a lot of NFL guys, so they probably brought a lot of them back. I don't know. But in the spring, Youngstown State was 1-6, and six, which is very un-Youngstown State-like. Now, of course, the Big Ten, they there's uh, uh, they're not really encouraging or allowing the scheduling of FCS opponents anymore. Michigan State already had this game scheduled, so it got grandfathered in. Mark D'Antonio was a proponent of scheduling this back when he was the head coach because of his friendship with Jim Tressel, the president of Youngstown State, also D'Antonio with a lot of respect for Youngstown State University. So if you're going to pay somebody to come in and play, he said, let's just pay Youngstown. So that's why it happened. Turns out it's not a great Youngstown team. Youngstown was 1-6 in, in the spring. They lost to North Dakota State. They lost to Northern Iowa. Northern Iowa was, uh, you know, and, and that's the other side of the coin. Northern Iowa played a spring season and then they went out last weekend and nearly beat Iowa State. If they had knocked off Iowa State, I'm just wondering how much of an impact would that spring, you know, you're just coming in a good 1AA FCS program, Northern Iowa, and I, I haven't looked at their schedule, but I assume Northern Iowa played five or six games in the spring. So Northern Iowa's always pretty good. They've beaten the Hawkeyes in the past. So they're, they're always pretty good. Does that make Northern Iowa even better on September 4th? I think Iowa State found out, yes. So, I mean, Youngstown State, they lost to North Dakota State, who's good. Lost to Northern Iowa, who's good. This is in the spring. Lost to Southern Illinois. Lost to South Dakota State. Lost to Western Illinois. Lost to Missouri State. They beat South Dakota. And that season ended April 10th, which I think was around the time of the Michigan State spring game. That was maybe a week before the spring game. So they played seven games from February 21st to April 10th, which makes um, them an, an interesting opponent all right so let's let's go over here to the to the chat area Matthew Johnson checked in for the north neighborhood I gotta catch up see where we were George Page former keyboard player Ford to surrender Dorothy I think it was keyboard player by the way George you heard I said last week about BJ is it PJ or BJ I never know what to call him. He's a friend of mine. He's an acquaintance. I see him. He jogs by. It's PJ. He apparently was in Surrender Dorothy also, right? Anyway, George Page says, Go Green, Go White chant at Northwestern was loud. Spartan fans showed up in Evanston. I would agree. Chase Landis. What's the situation with Horst? No situation. Starting left tackle. They thought he did okay. Brad Vashenko checking in from Austin, Texas. Kyle Priestley says, been looking forward to this all week. Thanks, Kyle. Jeff Blanche says, any updates on White? No. No. Talking about the receiver who says he's going to be coming back soon, but no updates there. Dakota Vandentorn. Vandentorn says, Horst limped off the field but looked sore after the game. Didn't seem serious. Okay, thanks for clearing that one up. Um... Troy Spartan says, love that Italian glow in HD. Uh, I don't, it's not supposed to be HD unless something changed. All right. HD is not my friend, I wouldn't think. New guy says, swag surfing from Grand Rapids tonight. Love the new entrance song. So is that a, is that a real thing? I have to uh, do a search here. Okay, there's something... There was a report, it looks like. All right, I'll have to look into that a little bit more. George Pace says, Comp, what are your thoughts on today's news? 
with Matt Ishby's donation for student athletes, how much do you think this will impact recruiting? It's a big part of recruiting, name, image, and likeness. If you go to a school and you know that if you go there, there's a really good chance that a that you know uh, an entity like United Wholesale Mortgage will sponsor you. That is a that's. It's a it's an arms race, right? And most programs are going to have those type of benefits for their athletes. So you can't be caught being the one that does not have those type of benefits for your athletes. So Michigan State's getting out ahead. Will they be one of the f- forerunners of it? It's possible. Uh, you know, I talked to Izzo about that a little bit. You know, I, I, yesterday I said, what does an athletic director have to do in terms of name, image, and likeness to get that set up? And he says, technically right now the rules say we can't do that. And I said, do you think it's always going to be like that? He said, I don't know. So, but no question, you know, Ishbia's group has the green flag to help in any way they can. And it's no secret Michigan State's going to have, is in good position there to sponsor a lot of their athletes. Question is, how, which sports do you sponsor? Can you sponsor all of them? That's where it's going to be interesting to see if you have benefactors that just want to sponsor, like, baseball, if that can happen. And can that help get a program going and might uh, and that can happen like Illinois maybe Illinois has a guy that just wants to sponsor baseball players and over the course of three four five six years that program could get stronger based on something like that because I, I, I suspect that not every baseball program in the Big Ten is going to have great sponsorships name image and likeness but those that do that can help especially sport like that where so many of those players are are only getting partial sp- scholarships JJ Huddle 79 says sipping Evan Williams bottled in bond. I don't know what that means, but I uh I endorse that. Detroit Spartan says who else cashed who else cashed in on the Northwestern game? Sounds like Detroit Spartan had a wager on the Spartans. Keith Tunstall says, About time, comp, you're late. Andrew Erdman says, How's the wide receiver depth looking? Looks like Reed, Naylor, Mosley played ninety percent of the snaps. That's true. That's strange because I think the depth is good. Montori Foster had a good camp. And he was my pick to be one of the top underclassmen this year, but that's not going to happen because they're only playing about four wide receivers. Christian Fitzpatrick played a snap or two. Ian Stewart played a snap or two. And when they came onto the field, it was pretty clear it was going to be a running play if you go back and look at it. Now that you know what the play selection was. So they've got to make sure that when those guys check in that they're still putting the ball in the air. But I think Stewart has ability. Fitzpatrick has ability. And Montori Foster has ability. I think those are the three. So I think the depth is good. I just don't know how I, 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 they just might be rolling with those top three, which is a strange way to do it. Um, the previous staff would use more wide receivers, but maybe that maybe there's a point of diminishing returns when you do that. It could be debated, I guess. Timo Slice says, did Hunt get hurt? And if so... Is this why we saw Kyle King on the field? Kyle King, redshirt freshman, defensive tackle from Indiana. Jalen Hunt, starting defensive tackle, played about 11 snaps. Yes, he did get hurt. Uh, no word on the severity of that. Was putting weight on it, but um, would not be surprised if they hold him out of this game. They'll need him against Miami, I would imagine. They expected him to be the, their best all-around defensive lineman, so need him on the field. Dakota Vandentorn says, sipping some homemade mead. Entertain me, comp. Homemade mead. Mead. I was not well-versed in what mead is, and then I learned it's a beverage, an adult beverage, and instead of barley or hops, it's fermented, is it rice? Or lemons or something like that? I don't know, but I talked about it on this particular show several months ago that I went up to Frankfurt and Beulah. I think it's Beulah, Michigan, which is on the east end of Crystal Lake, not far from Frankfurt. There's a distillery there, and they have something called John Lemon. You like John Lennon with the glasses, the Beatles, but it's called John Lemon. It's a lemon-flavored mead. The reason I like it is because it's gluten-free. i got to stay gluten-free, so I can't really drink many beers. I'm not a real big beer enthusiast like I said earlier, but that stuff was good. Mead. So good for you. And if I see that around the store, I might have to partake in some if I can find some of that John Lemon mead. Solid. Um, but good for you with mead. I appreciate that. Gordon Tenonis' state will be 6-1 and one going into the Michigan game. Wow. He's calling it. Can you imagine? What's Michigan's record going to be? Looked okay last week, right? 
Jeff Blant says, what do you think of the deep ball coverage? We went over the video a little bit about uh, the one with Gervin. Angelo Gross didn't get deep enough. Got to be deep as the deepest. He saw that number one was out there in a threat, but he undercut it. Chose the wrong club. Ronald Williams was beaten on the one. We talked about that earlier. Went for an offhand jam, then he kind of stumbled. Ronald Williams needs to get better at that. I was a little bit, I just wasn't sure about, it was just, it's kind of awkward there a little bit. I was expecting a little more fluidity out of, uh, fluidity there. So that's got to get better there at corner. I thought Gervin looked a little, a little bit faster than last year. He's always had decent speed, but when he ran down that one dude to save a touchdown, first play of the second half, showed some speed there. Um, fresh, of course, because first play of the second half, but so was the tailback. But Reed, uh, Kalen Gervin did a good job against the run. He, sh- he was showing some of that physicality that Tucker likes out on the edge to defeat wide receiver blocks, set the edge, help send a ball carrier back to the help. I thought Gervin was doing that. Uh, deep balls. Youngstown will go deep. They'll, they'll, they'll test it. They're not going to test it with guys that can run like that dude that transferred from Kansas. He's pretty good. But they'll see some speed against Miami, no question about it. I know uh, Alabama mopped the grass with them, with the Hurricanes, but Hurricanes, they got some speed. Uh, no shocker there, but I saw a little bit of the ACC all-access program with Miami a couple weeks ago. And just watching them in practice, they got some guys that can run. No no, no surprise there. So they'll get tested again in that game. Kendra Handy says, Ronald Williams is very green at DB. He is still developing. He was a quarterback until about three years ago. That's exactly right. Keith Tunstall says, Crouch and Kale got lost in pass coverage a couple of times. I was looking for Kirk. You know, A.J. Kirk, I'm not sure A.J. Kirk was there. But Crouch... Uh, yeah, Crouch, yeah. I thought Cal, Cal Halliday did a good job in pass coverage several times, but getting lost, if you saw it, I'll take your word for it, but I didn't really notice that. I'll have to go back and look at it again. I mean, well, they were getting lost. When, when Northwestern started going to the air and dinking and dunking and moving the ball in the second half, Michigan State was playing more and more of a cover four and, and some cover three, but they weren't challenging and matching up as much they were playing the clock and, and not not wanting to give up any big ones you could say that's prevent but when you're up three touchdowns with 10 minutes to go you know I, I can kind of understand it so getting a lot lost in coverage I think there was some soft zone being played there a few times Dakota Van Den Torn says Crouch ran into the ref twice that I saw when he could have made some good plays one that would have stopped a 40-yard rip by Northwestern. You know, I I think we just talked about that a minute, minute ago, and I think that was Dowell, the one that you're talking about, ran into the umpire. Harold Young, Harold Joyner, enthusiast, says, Thank you, Cobb. I will tell Perrysburg coaches that I can't attend classes tomorrow because of Spartan Mag. Yeah, you don't have to go to school tomorrow. Kendra Handy says, Is Crouch a junior? I think he is, yeah. Wally Pelton says, What's the history of calling Spartan Stadium the woodshed? I've seen it on a couple of graphics recently. That goes back to the Saban era. And Golden Pat Rule dubbed it that. That's back in the mid-90s when Chris Fowler and those guys on ESPN Game Day and also College Football Live, which was a show that would, I think, air on Thursdays, that became a buzzword of theirs that if you blew out a team, it was called you, you took the team to the woodshed. For instance, this past weekend, Alabama took Miami to the woodshed. It's an old colloquialism, meaning if you take someone to the woodshed, that might have been been a way of disciplining youths, perhaps your own offspring, living out on the prairie. You take them, someone gets in trouble, mama says, take that kid, teach him a lesson. Papa says, come on, son, we're going to the wood, back behind the woodshed, take him to the woodshed, and uh, corporal punishment. Taking someone to the woodshed, Alabama took Miami to the woodshed. So, Pat Rule thought that Spartan Stadium needed a nickname, and Michigan State was starting to become a pretty good team, and Golden Pat liked the idea that Michigan State's newly sunken field, which was sunk in 1994 with the big walls, he felt it, it was like, it, 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 to, to Pat, Rule, Pat Rule, who was offensive line coach for Saban at the time, Pat Rule said, man, it's like coming out here, and it, it's like, it's like a Roman Colosseum or something. You're in a pit and you can't get out and people just on you. And between that, which has nothing to do with the woodshed, but he's playing off the Chris Fowler ESPN woodshed thing. He says, let's call our place the woodshed. You know what happens in the woodshed. When you come to the woodshed, that's what's going to happen. So that's 
the reason behind that. And it, it caught on for a couple of years, but then as the coaches turned over and Michigan State had different levels of success, it didn't really didn't really fit. I always kind of like the idea of greenhouse, like the greenhouse effect. It's not quite as aggressive, but because it's green, you know. But I don't, I don't know if you really need to name every single stadium, but whatever. Angelo Gross, Harold Joyner, enthusiast, says, I think it's more of a general saying. Uh, Detroit Spartans says, bad angle by Gross. Yes. 313 Hitman says, go green, go white. Brian V says, nice hold on Jordan on that deep ball. Total miss by the ref. Good point. Don Strait, all watching. Give some thumbs up. Uh, appreciate your support there. Holding on Jonathan was obvious on that play. Gross is terrible in zone coverage, says Kendra Henry. Yeah, you know, Gross has a lot to learn there. You know, he played nickel last year, has been a corner in the past, so making those reads back there to safety is is new for him. Naylor's going to do better against Youngstown State, says 313. Yeah, man. Kendra Handy says, scheme-wise, we need someone a little taller and longer than Gross back there. Yeah, you know, he's he's on the shorter side back there. Gives up some of that, but they like the way he can tackle. But that's you know that was a different move when they moved him from nickel to safety. So it remains to be seen how it all works out. But uh, how good the defense is, you're only as strong as your weakest link, and it can it can't. They need that to not be a link, a, a weak link. Uh, but they believe in him. But he's got to learn as he goes. Let's go back to the mailbag, and then we'll come back to this and call it a night. Question 10 from Cool Breezes 503 from Royal Oak, Michigan. Says, hey, Jim, first time in a long time. First time in a long time. Wondering what you thought about Angelo Gross at free safety. Thanks. I'll hang up and listen. Uh, we've already talked about him. We just did a minute ago. Good tackler. Error on the Kalen Gervin deep ball. We, we talked about that one. He's got a lot to learn. He's given it a shot. Safety. Um, you know, Kendall Brooks is back there as a second stringer. Emmanuel Flowers is a second stringer. Trent Robinson's not walking through that door, you know. Um, Curtis Drummond not walking through that door. So they think there's good long-term potential with Gross. And two, a couple of years from now, we might be amazed that we ever doubted him. But right now, he's got, he's got uh, some learning to do there. He knows that. He's working on it. Question number 11, Sparte from Parts Unknown. He says, how much... Did we underestimate the importance of Beasley returning a defensive end for one more year? And what was your assessment of him against Northwestern? I just did a couple of, I just mentioned earlier, a, a couple of plays that he made that were that pretty good. You know, they move him to defensive tackle on third downs. Um, I wonder if he would have a chance to get more sacks if he stayed at defensive end at third down because you've got more of a two-way go. He got a quarterback hurry at defensive tackle on Saturday. But they move him inside because they figure Jordan's coming in. And Panashuk technically has a chance to do things on the outside. Maybe I would like Panashuk moving inside on third down and Beasley staying outside. I wonder if that's something they would they would consider. They consider everything. But wouldn't be shocked if I saw that. But Beasley's become a good leader, good solid player. Yeah, he's a keeper. They, they want him around. He's, he was honorable mention all Big Ten last year. I think he has potential to match that this year even while playing fewer snaps because there's a little more depth there question number 12 sparty on 318 says why in the world did tucker think matt coglin could make a 60 yard field goal before that kick he was one of four from 50 yards for his career and the one he made was only 51 side note what's going on with coglin's hair that's from sparty on 318 coglin's got the beard going he's scraggly he's you know Coughlin's, what, like 28 years old now? Been around a while, been a good kicker. Coughlin made a 55-yarder at the open practice. Now, I know that's not against Tootal Jones coming at him, but they did have a, a, a field goal block on to an extent. It's more of a thud on. There's like a, not going to be anyone diving at the kicker in an open practice, but he made a 55-yarder. Missed that one, didn't come close. Would have had a better chance at a Hail Mary in hindsight, but... They gave him a chance at a 60-yarder because they've seen him make 60-yarders before. That was last play of the half. They went in for halftime, locker room, came back out, and during warm-ups before the third quarter, Coglin put the ball on the 50-yard line, teed it up, and made a 60-yarder. Now, that was off a tee. You know, I mean, that was off of like a holder tee, not a snap and a timing and a rush and all that. 
He ha- he has the leg to make it from 60. I saw him do it. Now, I know a lot of you guys see guys make 65 yarders in pregame. Doesn't make mean you can make a 65 yarder in a game, but they had him do it because they thought he could make it. I was surprised by it, and after he came up 10 yards short, I was like, uh, you know, Hail Mary would have worked better. It was really interesting that they set that up with a running play on the last play before the half rather than a pass. That was interesting. Uh, question 13, Matt in Grand Rapids, Michigan says, Jim, what are your thoughts on Peyton Thorne so far? How much improvement do you think we will see from him getting exclusive first-team reps throughout the year. Also, do you have an hour to explain what is or isn't targeting? No, I cannot explain what targeting is. I mean, they did they put in a targeting rule to eliminate blows to the head. Dude for the other team, Northwestern, comes and hits a shoulder shot at Joyner, knocks him out, and it's not targeting. Um, I know in hockey you can't hit the head at all. You know, targeting, I guess you can't use the crown of the head and, and leap or uh, you, you know, project yourself. Back in the 70s and 80s, they used to call that spearing. Now it's like they're going to change the word targeting, and, you know, they've, they've changed, you know, the, with the ejection and all that. But you've never technically supposed to have been able to tackle with your head. But in the 80s, late 80s, it became, you know, Jack Tatum style of play, you know, Doug Plank, uh, I don't know if Doug Plank did it. He might have. I don't know. But Miami Hurricanes, used to, when they were great, they'd, and Florida State run around and hit you with hit you head as a weapon. So they wanted to take that out of the game. It never should have been allowed in the game in the first place because it's been against the rules forever. Spearing is what they used to call it. So anyway, um, shoulder to the head. I mean, I think what it should be is shoulder to the head, flag. I heard somebody say this on the radio the other day, and I think it's a pretty good idea. It should be like, okay, you can't hit the guy in the head. You hit him in the head. We're not going to kick you out of the game, but we'll essentially like give you a yellow card. Now, I know a lot of you purists are like, man, don't bring yellow cards into football. We don't want anything re- resembling soccer and football. I, I I don't feel that way. I know some of you probably feel that way. But you, can't, you hit him in the head. You didn't do it on purpose, but it's kind of your responsibility to not hit him in the head. 15-yard penalty, maybe yellow card. You do it twice, exit. Now, that's different than launching yourself, crown of the head, you know, helmet to helmet, that's targeting. Everybody can see that. But what what essentially they said the other night is it's okay to hit a dude forearm shiver to the head, which I thought you're not supposed to do. So, no, I can't take an hour to explain that. But that that's, I mean, they're trying to get rid of head injuries, and a guy has a head injury because a guy took a shoulder right in the head. I don't understand that at all. I don't know. I can't help you with that. Peyton Thorne, we went over some video earlier. I think he's doing a good job um, with some reads. You know, we, we went over some video earlier. I know it's getting kind of late, but I like looking at this stuff. Let me see. This is the beginning of it. Let me let me fast forward past these that we've already seen. All right, that was the, the cross earth middle of the field open. What's this? All right, that's that screen that how they made a play. Stepping up in the pocket. Hit Mosley. Don't read keep. Screen pass touchdown. Maverick hands a tackle for loss. All right, that's the last one I think we saw. All right, this is the blitz. We're talking earlier about this is a, the sack, third and goal, one of the turning points of the game because Northwestern had a little bit of Momentum here, 21-7. They score here is 21-14. First drive of the second half. It could be a different game. Game Game-changing play right here. Zero zero coverage, zero blitz, no safety. As was the case earlier in the game like we showed, you have the linebackers into the A-gaps pressed up on the line of scrimmage. The difference here is safety is with them. Linebackers coming, and so is the safety. Big sack, big play. But there is... An open receiver. Was it number five or 17 on the crosser? Because Kalen Gervin kind of gets picked. Watch the outside receiver to the left. Kalen Gervin off coverage. Inside release. You get a pick. A rub right there. 17's open. Could have, should have been a touchdown. A, a, a wiser quarterback might anticipate that quicker and get rid of it, but Hunter Johnson not quite there yet. Here's that play they ran earlier. Oh, this is that third and two. Under center. With the two, with the tight end and the H, tight end and the wing together again on the left side this time, motion. Now watch Jalen Naylor. 
number eight, split end, coming in motion. He's going to enter at the C gap. Wide receiver becomes a lead blocker on third and two. Naylor, boom. He doesn't really kill that guy. But that's an all-Big Ten safety, but puts him on his heels. 16 makes the tackle, but and Naylor's, not, Naylor's not happy with himself because he would have rather just like planted that guy. But the guy that he hits an all-Big Ten safety, that was good. But to, use, to utilize a wide receiver as a lead blocker there, that's pretty innovative. Works pretty good. Let's get back to Thorne and see if we've got something on Thorne. All right, counter boot. All right, this is a good one. Good play design, pistol. Really hard for linebackers to see what's going on here because you've got 97 Hunt on split zone action, wham block action. You've got you got eight Naylor coming in motion, hands out with his hands, like faking handoff. It's hard for a linebacker to see who's got the ball here. So they're going to suck up into it. Now you got a counter boot, half roll, and you've got three level flood here, kind of a sail concept. You got a deep kind of a deep fade, and you've got to check down, and then you've got number one, Reed, who's open as part of it, but he goes to the deeper choice, and 17 Mosley makes a one-handed catch here. But it's good desi good design, very hard to defend, and Thorne is decisive with it. Makes a quick read, going to go deep with it. Decides he's going to take a shot on first and 10. And one thing about Jay Johnson, he likes to go deep on first and 10. A couple of, you know, he likes to go deep the first play of a drive, like, once or twice a game. you start to see that. What's this one? More Peyton Thorne. Eh, not a whole lot there. That was just that was just reading the comeback against cover four. What what is it? That's third down. That's that's what makes this one good. All right, so you got four across off coverage. Looks at the whole way, waits waits for like the comeback curl right there at the sticks. Right in front of the Cover four. Good dec decisiveness there. Is he staring it down a little bit? Not so much because because they're bailing pretty deep on that. Now, this is an RPO. See, the run blocking, the offensive line is run blocking on this. On this one. It's a first and 10. He's got a, the, the slot receiver there, number 17, Mosley, has got a free release. It's first and 10, so he's just, he's just going to go ahead and take six yards, Baylor style. But watch the offensive linemen. The offensive linemen are run blocking. It's run blocking up front. It's an RPO. Quarterback's got a decision. He, he's, he's got the option to run the run play or pass it. He chooses the pass. A little pitch and catch for, I think, 11 yards. RPO sewn in. I think this is the cover two hole. Yeah. All right, so Northwestern didn't run play a lot, did not play a lot of cover two, but they do on this one. You have a corner squatting over in the flat, and the safety has the half. So you got a cover two hole. You got a smash concept, 17 runs and out. So you got an out and a cover two hole. So he, he gives a little, Thorne gives a little nod to the short one and goes to the longer one into the cover two hole because it's behind the corner into the side of the safety. See the corner. Is at the 13 yard line because he corner on cover two has the flat, so he stays in the flat and honors that nod to the short man. And the safety's got half the field, so the cover two hole is the area there that's a little weak area that the safety can't get over to and the corner can't get back to. Cover two hole gets it to him inside the 10 yard line. Didn't see a lot of cover two from them, but the one time he sees it, Thorne makes a quick diagnose and goes to it. It's good quarterbacking. So, uh, so I, I like a lot of the decision making that Thorne was doing, for sure. Poised, second start, and I think he'll get better. Assume he'll get better, and that's that's not a bad position from which to improve. Do we have another? Where are we? What question are we? I think that'll do it. Uh CJ from South Philadelphia, recovering from Tropical Storm Ida, says, I hope you had a great time in Evanston. What were your three biggest surprises last week? He says, my biggest surprises were Halliday starting, the struggles with the deep ball, and former starters as backups, Eli Collins, Trent Gillison, and Noah Harvey. Asterisk on Collins due to her injury. I'm not sure about Collins on the injury. He played a little bit of special teams. Maybe you know something I didn't know, or maybe I missed a memo on something. I don't know. But Gillison... Basically, third or fourth string, former four-star guy, just not getting on the field. Play to the very end. 
I don't know if it's possible to get more out of him, but that would be nice if they could get that because tight end is not a strength. Even with Connor Hayward doing some things, Connor Hayward's blocking, especially on pass protection. Pass protection for tight ends was not great in this game. Uh, Hunt gave up a sack, and Hayward kind of gave up a pressure and got away with holding once. So, um, biggest surprises, yeah, not only Halliday starting, but starting, in my opinion, excelling, playing some good football. I'm not saying he was Dick Butkus out there, but he was pretty good. Wide receiver blocking was a big surprise for me, how good it was. And Ronald Williams, deep ball. Not only did he give up the one deep ball, but I thought he was, just, like I said, awkward and uh, and was kind of getting ungainly there a little bit on some intermediate routes. He needs to improve there. All right, let's go back over here to the comments area. And maybe he's got the ability to, to do that. And like Mel Tucker said this week, it's an old cliche, but your best, your most improvement comes, comes between week one and week two. Maybe that'll be Ronald Williams now. It was his first college start because he was he played two or three or four games for Alabama last year coming off a broken arm. So I'll cut him some slack. It's his first college start. But it's one thing to have some struggles if you've got good feet and you're just trying to learn things like Crouch, who started for Tennessee last year. It's another thing if if the feet aren't so fluid, and that's that's my concern there. 313 Hitman says, Penix was overrated and it showed. Cameron Trigg says, who is Michigan State's recruiting the hardest for 2022 football and basketball? Well, football, they're still in on Dylan Tatum and Goodwin. Basketball, Michigan State with a couple losses lately with Jaden Shoot committing to Duke. And Jaden Shute had a lot of great things to say about Michigan State when I talked to him in the spring. And then when I saw him again at the Under Armour Nationals in Indianapolis in July, that was about two weeks after Duke offered. And when we talked to him there, when I talked to him there, I talked to him with Jeff Carson, who covers some recruiting for us and also the IllinoisRivals.com site. So he was kind of there for Illinois. We're both talking to him. And Jaden Shute... He's a shooter, six foot five from suburbs of Chicago, athletic guy, good shooter. Uh shoot was much more tight lipped. Like, like he he like he, there were three or four questions that he responded with the exact same answer, meaning I'm not gonna answer that question. And he wasn't like that before. And I said to myself, and I think I told Jeff also, I said something's changed with him. Uh that Duke offer changed him. I don't know if it it's if it obviously gave him a lot to consider. Was he leaning strongly toward Duke at that point? Well, he committed Duke you know, a month later, so probably so. But his uh, forthcoming nature to answer questions was much more buttoned down, which is his prerogative. I'm not criticizing him at all. Young kid's got to live his life. That's fine. I just There was a difference in his interviews after the Duke offer. And now we know why. Uh, 313 Hitman says, Naylor did drop that one block on him. Woo. Detroit Spartan says, I mentioned Halliday during the last Spartan Mac Live. The kid has a motor that never stops, loves contact, and works his tail off. Clean that up a little bit. Reed had a great game, Detroit Spartan says. Dakota Van Torn says, can we get fireworks like Northwestern? Uh, for a night game, I mean, Michigan State has one night game this year. Interesting concept. Larry Franks. Larry Frank says, I liked Klein at linebacker. What do you think? Chase Klein got back and, and uh, had a pass breakup on one. Barely got back there in time, but, it, but they really stretched him. They went after him, and he got back there. He, he runs pretty well. There was one play that was an outside run. He was going sideline to sideline. Did not quite get to the sideline in time prevent it from turning the corner. I'm sure he would have liked to have gotten there an instant sooner. I think he's an okay, I think he's okay. I think he's a decent backup like he was last year. He's behind Crouch. Could he push Crouch? I don't know, but he's going to get some playing time, especially as they get ready to play Miami. Yes, he did. Reed and Mosley did their thing despite Walker taking over. 313 Hitman says, Swag surface is Platon Fleetmeyer, Kendra Handy. Keep chopping. 313 Hitman says, I expect Jordan Simmons to get more involved next week. Interesting interesting prediction there. Detroit Spartan says, Walker's always square and moving forward. Love his downhill running style. He does get downhill, and he's got some strength, too. Not only does he have that burst and vision, but when, you, when you're when you fortunate enough to get a hand on him, then you got to bring him down. It's not easy. Interesting. Interesting the way he's burst on the scene. Noah Page says, Jim, how do you think the offensive line holds up against some more elite pass rush 
and run stoppers do you think Kenny made them look a little better than they were? They were just kind of good. You know, they weren't they weren't like steamrolling people. So and those offensive linemen love blocking for a guy that can find daylight like he does. I don't, you know, against the elite pass rush, I mean Penn State graduated some elite pass rushers. Ohio State's going to have elite pass rush, I would imagine. You know, last year Michigan had Quiddy Pay, they kept him quiet. Uh I don't know what elite pass rushers Michigan State's going to face. I'm sure that some will come up. 99 for Northwestern was okay. I you know I you know uh, you know Miami's got some. I can't think of their names now. Did they have a did they have a grad transfer as a pass rusher or a portal guy? So I think they'll be okay. Horst our Curry. I mean our Curry last year was decent against good pass rushers. They'll be better than we were last year when, when it was our Curry and Jarvis. So I'm not going to sit here and say that they're going to be like Alabama and just stop everybody, but they'll be okay. I don't think they'll. I don't. I don't. I don't think that's going to. I don't think they'll be stainless, but I don't think it's a huge um, liability. Pass protection against elite pass rushers. They'll they'll bat eighty percent, which I think is pretty good. All right, there we go. Yep, OCD, it's working. Yeah, uh, the thing was is my my accord over when we lost. I thought I lost sound before. I'm really concerned about that because we've had that problem here. But the problem wasn't here; it was on this cord over here because it kind of shorts out too. So I kind of freaked out. Eric Locke says, "Comment question. My main concern this year's pass defense: the lack of play among our reserve corners worries me. The lack of pass rush concerns." maybe even more. What are your thoughts? I agree. Pass rush is not great. And the defensive back seven has to get on the same page. The corners, I think Kalen Gervin was okay, but you know, he's had, he's been a mixed bag over the years. Ronald Williams, I kind of expected him to be cleaner in that game. Needs to bounce back and show that he's got some good footwork. I don't know. Chester Kimbrough didn't see much of him. Uh, I think he's got potential in the second string and Chuck Brantley. They love, he's, he's light as a feather though. So, I understand. It's it's not a complete team. With a lack of four-man pass rush and some questions in pass defense, yeah, there's some teams that can take advantage of that. The good ones will. Andrew Dunlap says, after seeing our terrific performance, what do you think our final record will be this season? I don't know, you know. I think I said 7-5 and five earlier, but that's up from 6-6. Six and six. It's rising. Vegas had them at 4.5, right? I could understand a little bit of that, but, you know, the definite losses, Ohio State, I guess. Miami's going to be difficult. And, you know, Penn State's looking a little, little bit better, but by Thanksgiving, playing any slanting, who knows? Indiana, not as strong. Michigan might be a little stronger for now, but that could all combust at any moment. Purdue. Purdue, who, they beat a team from the West Coast. Who was it? Uh... Not sure what's going to happen with Purdue. I didn't get a real close look at that game. A lot of swing games. You know, Maryland beat West Virginia. Pretty good win for them. Rutgers destroyed Temple. I did not see that game. It's a mosh pit. And any of those games, like, like Tucker said, they'll go into every game thinking that they, they're going to win or can win. Does that mean they expect to go 12-0? Well, I guess if you have tunnel vision, maybe it's possible. You know, really, it's not possible, but that's that's the mindset of an athlete, right? By the same token, Tuck, Tucker said, there's not a team on our schedule that is not capable of beating us, meaning you go out and fumble the ball seven times like you did against Rutgers last year, you're going to lose to Rutgers again. So Rutgers, Maryland, these teams are good enough to beat you. Purdue are good enough to beat you if you bring a C-minus game. So to Michigan State to harness that level of consistency, the quality control, tighten the screws, and not come forward with a C-minus game any time this year. Eight and four is possible. Maybe better. I don't know. It's college football. That's why we're watching. Uh, Marco Rolo says, didn't know there was so much love for heavy metal and Spartan Nation. That's a problem. Peyton Fleetmeyer says, swag surfing better than Mr. Brightside. Mr. Brightside's a quality song, though. Stephen Iliff says, snow and hell, they played quite a bit. Snow got about I think about 35% of the snaps at the nickel behind Dowell. Going to gonna need to keep that position fresh in a couple of weeks at Miami. Peyton Fleet Meyer says, Texas A&M has the best entrance song. I don't know what their entrance song is. 
Peyton Fleetmeyer care to share that with us? Caleb Walburn says, shocked Iowa's entrant isn't Ram Ranch by Grant McDonald. I don't know what that means. What's this? Marco Rolo says, would like to see Crouch sent on blitzes. He's a former running back and should be able to dodge blockers. I think you're right. I think you will see more of that. Noah Sprunger says, yeah, swag surf and comp. I didn't know that. Often, I got to do some research on that to see what that's about. I'm sure it's good. Blong John says, would love them to come up with a war drum cadence to take the field. Interesting. I respect Blong John's opinion. Uh, he's a creative mind. Get that Sparta thing going. Could you do that with the failing somehow? That's interesting. Randy Sebastian says, a subscriber to your channel. Big fan of your shows. Thanks, Randy. As well, MSU had a spark with the offense. I have never seen. Our defense is coming along, too. I think we got a shot at Ohio State. I'll have some of what Randy's drinking, but we appreciate Randy. Shout out to Ohio State. Well, Ohio State's got to play. But Ohio State, if they continue to play defense like that, someone's going to take them down in the Big Ten, I think. I, I said it last year. I didn't think it was a great move when Grinch left and they elevated Kerry Coombs, the defensive coordinator. He's never been a coordinator at that level. That's uh, And last year the defense was not great. And I, I said, like, two-thirds of the way through the season, they would not win the national title. They got closer than I thought. They got to the title game. I wouldn't have thought they would have beaten Clemson. But they were just kind of – they uh, they are not tip-top on defense. Good athletes, good players, but they're not tip-top, you know, tightening the screws. Ben says, the kids would hate 80s hair metal, let's be honest. Well, I mean, that's what – Thunderstruck kind of is, right? I, I know that ACDC precedes hair metal, but they were part of it. Keith Tunstall says, Spartan's new theme song should be Cult of Personality. Huh. Yeah. You know what? That would work. I'm not sure that the lyrics lend themselves to football, but the you could almost like drop the lyrics and just just and just put it on a on an instrumental loop. Instrumental loop with just the chorus, maybe. With some other stuff mixed in. I I, I kind of I think you could, I don't I don't hate that. Larry Frank says, "Let the team choose." I said earlier that you, you know that it's not necessarily for the team. The team is usually in the tunnel while it's going on, so they don't come out to it. They come out to the fight song. They. That that song is before they take the field. Matthew Johnson says, "I like the Sparty slashing the flag, but I don't like the graphics that are stuck in the '90s. Kind of ruins it." Good point. Ben says, "Come on, man, Mo Ager's song was pretty bad." Dane McBain says, "Has to be the final countdown." No, 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 no. I appreciate you posting. Um, I used to like hair metal back in the days, back when I had hair. But uh, final countdown. Donovan Thomas says, wait, are we changing the entrance? Ben says, I say pick a Michigan-themed song in semi-recent, like Jack Black. Do you mean Jack White? Oh, there you go, Jack White laughing out loud. Um, Michigan, you know, that's, Eminem would be in that category. Bernard, it's a dead point now because Swag Surfing apparently is the song. How about Smoke on the Water? Yeah, again, that's that's kind of... It's kind of aggressive, but it's, it's, it's kind of slow. It's really kind of tired and really dated. But it's heavy guitar, which I think is good. How about a Grand Funk tune? Grand Funk is a Michigan band. One of those guys used to live on Radley Lake Road. John White says, J-Rock win is a great song. Now we're just talking about songs here. For who the for whom the bell tolls or master of, of puppets. Metallica fan. John White, Kendrick Lamar, uh, Lamar DNA is a good song too. Larry Frank says, 
walk like a man, like Frankie Valley. Heinfrey says, let's get some call-in comps dialogue. He's getting a little tired of the, the, the music talk. Collins, we will do the call-ins post-game again this weekend, planning on it after the game, a couple hours after the game, three, four hours after the game. We'll get some call-ins to get your thoughts on the game. Didn't do it for the Northwestern game, of course, because the game ended at 1 in the morning, and I was working until 4 or 5, 8, 9, and 8 in the morning. Uh, but the post-game call-in show will do that. It'll be tricky for Miami. I'll have to figure out how to get that done there. But welcome to the jungle, says Brian Schultz. That's something Tony Mandrich used to tell defensive linemen. You know, after after he, like, early in the game, if he really got into somebody and planted them, he'd look at him on the ground and say, welcome to the jungle. I Meaning today is going to be, you know, you're going to die type of thing. That would that would work, you know. Guns and Roses, they got their own issues though. Not sure it's for everybody. Uh Spartan MD says, I don't feel tardy, but he was tardy. So Spartan MD gets a demerit. He's also hot for teacher. Kendra Handy says, pre snap motion is a big weakness of this defense. Well, we we just we just showed the touchdown and it was a uh it was a problem for that particular defense because Michigan State only had one defensive back on the field. So the so the unspoken communication that needs to take place on an unscouted look like that, it, it, it was a tough little puzzle that Northwestern threw at him and they gained a yard. They, they got a got a yard, got a touchdown. Iowa hit us with it a lot last year. You know, last year there were some things that happened, but you almost want to strike that from your memory and strike it from the record because they didn't really get to work with the team like they like they normally would. I know Rutgers did well with the time they had, but. Kendra Handy says, this is tricky stuff. It takes years for defenses to work this stuff. And, and this is something that teams will try and repeat. It's basically attacking your communication. Sledbet says, hey, I saw you at Meyer and Okemos a few hours ago. Yeah, that was me, Sledbet. I was over there. Um, I was looking for a rotisserie chicken for myself. And they were all gone. You can tell the students are back in town. So I had to grab a couple of steaks, threw them on the grill. But yeah, that was me. also got some... Tangerines. Yeah, I was at, I was at Okemos. Meyer. I like Meyer. AJ Abarashed says, have you ever been to Zaytun in Lansing? That's my dad's place. I've not been to Zaytun in Lansing. I don't know what that is. Might need, to, might need to look that up. Might need to take the show on the road one of these days. Zaytun. Oh, cool. It's a Mediterranean restaurant. Dude, I do like um, Mediterranean food. I like uh, hummus. I like uh, shawarma. Wow. Uh, is that the place? I went to a place over on St. Joe's in Lansing a couple times. It's pretty good. But no, I've not been there. i got to check that place out. And everybody over there in that part of Lansing, go check out Zaytun. All right, AJ. Donovan Thomas says... I like that the offensive line did good in run protection, but slacked in pass protection. Felt like they didn't give Thorne a lot of time. Cortinona says Guy Fieri had a segment from Zaytun. Okay. Guy Fiera, Fieri is the, one of those guys. Um, you know who he is. The, does the dives and restaurants and diners. Not that that's a dive, but that's that's cool. Uh, Kenneth Walker is supposed to run a 4 5 40, but he looked even faster against Northwestern. I would agree with that. Looks like we need to go ahead and wrap this up. Jay Jensen says, hey, says, hey buddy, go green. Jay Jensen, longtime friend of mine, good man up in Minneapolis. Met him 6 East Holden back in the 80s. He's one of the clowns that got me started on this hair metal crap. Uh, it's not crap. We are finishing this up. I'm just going through here. Make sure I don't miss anything else. Sorry I didn't get to all of these, but it's time to sign off. Spartan MD says, meat is fermented honey. There you go. Thank you. I'd forgotten that. It, interesting. And I, I'm a, I'm a mead. I'm going to go looking for some mead. I'm going to go looking for mead at either Tom's Party Store. I like Tom. Tom, I don't know if he's a subscriber, but he's aware of what we do over there in Grand River. Okemos, between Okemos and East Lansing. Or maybe I'll go to Okemos, uh, Meyer. Maybe you'll see me there again tomorrow. Looking for some mead. 
Will Michigan beat Washington? I would hope so. Try some Texas ranch water, tequila base, and gluten-free. Cheers. Texas ranch water. Interesting. Is Noah Kim ever going to play or is he going to transfer? W. Lee 68 says, I don't know if he's ever going to play because Thorne's pretty good and Kate Hauser's pretty good, but Noah Kim, if he transfers somewhere, he's going to be pretty good too. I think he's pretty good. I think he's pretty good. St. Max showed good feet, good foot speed on that screenplay. He showed a burst to get out in front and bury the guy. True, yes, he did. And also, it also helps that he wasn't playing a lot of snaps. So if you're not playing a lot of snaps, you've got a little bit more in reserve. But you're right, he's more athletic than Matt Allen. Cypress Wise has been waiting for this episode. Go green, John White says. Go white. Cypress Wise says, Thorne is money within 30 to 35 yards. He gets accuracy on the deep ball. If he does get accuracy on the deep ball, watch out. I agree, Cypress. Doors 91 says, disappointing we didn't see more of Michael Fletcher. I would agree with that. I thought with an extra a year older, the extra weight, some strength, I thought he was productive last year. I've always said he's not a complete defensive end, but kind of surprised. Hunter Page. Jalen Naylor had quite a night against Northwestern. What do you think it attributed to that? Had a quiet night. Okay. Do you think Mosley will surpass him as our number two? I think Mosley could. Mosley's more of a slot guy, uh, but Mosley might end up, you know, sometimes slot guys are more productive, but Naylor and Reed threaten things, and they usually keep them on different sides of the formation. But Mosley can benefit from that and work the intermediate routes or, you know, the deep out like he had a couple, uh, the one game against Northwestern. But, yeah, I, I wouldn't be surprised if Mosley uh, produces Naylor in receptions. Um, Doors Fan 91 says, okay, a ms entrance song is called Power by Kanye West. I'll have to look that up. Thanks, Peyton. Doors Fan 91 says, Cult of Personality is used by a popular wrestler, CM Punk. Not going to work for football. Okay. Peyton Fleetmeyer says, they got the best song, in my opinion. It gets super loud there, too. Kyle Weiss says, I'm a little worried about Youngstown State's transfer running back. Can't remember his name. Do you think we clean can clean up the missed tackles or do you think the defense may have trouble with him i've not looked at film yet i gotta find some i'm not familiar with him i gotta look into that later gml says edmund fitzgerald <laughs> can you imagine yeah matthew johnson says personally i wanted to run this town but swag surfing might be cool i want to run this town okay Wes blackman says i'll be the miami game live in south florida well, all right Wes, you keep it you keep things in order down there in South Florida for us. I'll be down there in a week and a half. Going to be at Spartan Stadium this Saturday. Michigan State taking on Youngstown State. The Penguins, they still call them the Penguins, right? Michigan State and the Penguins. It's going to be a good one for Michigan State, I would think. Youngstown's not what they have been. But uh, get a little more work in, get ready for the Hurricanes. And this season suddenly became really interesting with a lot, lot more hope. Um, not that that was outlandishly... An outlandish thought coming into the season. Didn't really know what Michigan State had. But I think uh, served some notice that there's some explo explosiveness there. And also, they've got a lot of work to do, too, which is a good thing. Anyway, appreciate everybody coming to the fun tonight, coming to the party. Make sure to check us out, I think, after the game on Sunday or on Saturday, a few hours after final whistle. We'll be back here taking some phone calls from you on Saturday, so come check us out then. Appreciate all the questions and all the sponsorships and uh, all the... All, all the contributions and just being here and being a part of the Spartan Mag community. We'll see you next time. My name is Jim Cop. I've already been watching Spartan Mag Live. See you, everybody.